this. So, all right, fantastic. Good morning, everybody. We're just gonna wait for a couple of minutes for people uh, to roll in. Uh, we have over 400 participants, so it'll take a second for everybody to uh, start rolling in. We're around 100 right now. I'm just gonna let uh, it go for a couple more minutes. Uh, let's see. Just uh, let me know if there's any issues. I think Justin is telling me looking good so far. <laughs> All right. All right, I think it's a good time to start. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Kimon Bekalis. I'm uh, the director of the Comprehensive Stroke Center at Good Samaritan Hospital. We're coming to you live from uh, Good Samaritan Hospital in West Islip, uh, the only comprehensive stroke center in the South Shore of Long Island. We are uh, uh, very privileged to have a, a great lineup today uh, of participants. Uh, this is our second um, comprehensive uh, stroke center uh, conference where we are discussing developments in stroke care and brain aneurysms. Uh, and we're integrating all our uh, sister hospitals in Catholic Health Services on Long Island and also we are uh, integrating other institutions and offering uh, educational opportunities uh, for the community. Uh, I wanna welcome uh, all our participants, uh, nurses, physicians, uh, EMS providers, uh, technologists, uh, advanced practice providers, and anybody else who's interested in joining us uh, in learning about stroke and brain aneurysms, two uh, aspects that are, uh, two pathologies that are very near and dear to my heart and two uh, most of the people that you'll be uh, listening to today. Uh, we, uh, it's, it's a rare treat to have this lineup of speakers. Uh, and, uh, you know, throughout a couple of housekeeping items, uh, I'll, be, uh, I'll be asking some questions throughout the conference today, uh, including uh, what type of uh, breakout seminars you would like to participate in. Uh, that they'll come as a poll uh, after the uh, initial comments that will be made. Uh, and uh, also, if you have any questions, feel free to use the chat function or the Q&A function of, uh, of uh, Zoom. This is a big undertaking. We're trying to have uh, a conference from 8 in the morning till 4 p.m. through Zoom. Uh, that's not an easy uh, task, so hopefully technology will participate uh, in our goal. Uh, if uh, there's any issues, obviously let us know uh, through all these functions, or uh, and, and we will uh, address them uh, without... Uh, uh, further ado, I want to this conference, and uh, I will uh, I will let uh, Dr. Shaughnessy, uh, who's uh, 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 leading uh, CHS uh, from the clinical perspective, he's our chief clinical officer, uh, will uh, we'll give a couple of remarks and uh, get us on our way. Dr. Shaughnessy, thank you for being here. Uh, go ahead. Come on, uh, thank you. And uh, I would agree with all of your opening comments. First of all, on behalf of Catholic Health Services and Good Samaritan Hospital and our Comprehensive Stroke Center, welcome to all of you. Uh, I would agree with Dr. Beckles. You're going to have a jam-packed, fun-filled virtual day. The speaking lineup is spectacular. The topics are spot on. And as the care of the stroke patient continues to evolve, uh, so does uh, the care uh, necessary. Uh, necessary. No longer a new process. What would you so so does the treatments and interventions needed to provide cutting edge care. So human ingenuity always prevails, as we saw with phase one of COVID nineteen, which, by the way, uh, we have seen thromboembolic and other uh, stroke like events secondary to COVID. So this is on the forefront, uh, forebrain for here everything that we needed to do in terms of. Uh, managing stroke patients uh, effectively as we go forward. So I want to thank all the faculty for your time today in making this a very productive conference and look forward to learning alongside with you. Dr. Beckles, back to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shaughnessy, and thanks everybody for attending. I see we are uh, increasing in uh, the number of participants. So I will um, uh, 
I will start by a brief overview of our program. So uh, I'm going to share my screen right now. Uh, so uh, I just want to give everybody a brief introduction. I know a lot of you are very familiar with uh, our Comprehensive Stroke Center, uh, but uh, uh, you know I'm going to I'm going to outline a little bit of uh, what we're doing here and what our mission is and and how we achieve uh, everything uh, we do. Uh, so. Uh, it, these are, oh, excuse me, these are, these are my disclosures. Nothing I'm going to talk about has anything to do with my uh, financial interest. Most of it is uh, really research funding. So our health system uh, is a faith-based system. Um, it's an extremely large uh, health system uh, involving multiple hospital beds across two counties in New York. And uh, these are, this is the distribution of the hospitals across Long Island. Uh, you can see we are positioned uh, in the South Shore in a, in a really strategic location. Um, there's six hospitals, three skilled nursing facilities, uh, regional nursing home service and hospice, and uh, we have an agency for special needs individuals. So our comprehensive stroke center has a fairly big catchment area, uh, which is outlined there. Uh, we have uh, multiple sister hospitals uh, that are feeding into the comprehensive stroke center, but there's collaboration between our hospital is in Suffolk County and in Nassau County. The way we're structured is that Good Samaritan Hospital provides the hub of these services for Suffolk County, whereas uh, St. Francis uh, provides uh, these services for Nassau County. And so uh, we have uh, arranged for transfer agreements between the hospitals. So Good Samaritan Hospital, which is the hub of the services for the Comprehensive Stroke Center, uh, is a 537-bed hospital. Uh, and uh, our service area, as I said, is uh, particularly large in the South Shore of Long Island and beyond. And this is the service area. What really makes us unique is that, uh, if you can see my mouse, we're positioned in this densely populated part of the South Shore of Long Island. So our primary catchment area is about 400,000 patients surrounded by another area uh, of another 400,000 patients. So a lot of stroke and a lot of brain aneurysms obviously uh, are, uh, are discovered uh, in that area. Our mission is, is uh, you know, very specific and, and we try uh, to make it a reality every day uh, of the week. So you know, our mission is to deliver comprehensive state-of-the-art stroke care that integrates preventative and rehabilitative services to patients with cerebrovascular disease. So every single word of this is uh, you'll see in, in the next couple of slides how we make it happen. Um, so our goals and objectives really uh, span anything from uh, understanding the outcomes uh, of these patients, heavy on quality, quality control. We strive to reduce complications and we try to create multidisciplinary collaborations across the hospital. Because as you'll see uh, uh, in the presentations to come, stroke is a multidisciplinary uh, uh, problem and, and you know it starts from the community uh, and it expands all the way into um, the hospital and then back into the community and the rehabilitative services. So we want to see innovation in diagnostic and therapeutic interventions. I'll show you a lot of research and what we do here uh, also provide stroke prevention and early symptom identification uh, and also educate the community and uh, the providers and, and part of that is today. Uh, as I said, we, we participate heavily in education. And most importantly, uh, I think this is a, a significant component of our goals and objectives is to support survivors in their uh, path to recovery. So you'll, uh, it's, it's a rare treat today. We have, uh, we have uh, the, the, the head of the, uh, of, the, of the foundation, the Lisa Cole Gross Foundation, which is, uh, has done tremendous work when it comes to survivors and to raising awareness uh, for brain aneurysms. So our program is based on four pillars, and I'm going to go through all these pillars um, in detail, but the, the first and most important uh, is clinical care. We, we try to provide best clinical care uh, to, us, uh, to achieve superior clinical outcomes and patient satisfaction. So our, our scope of services spans from ischemic stroke with all its etiologies, the treatments available, every treatment is available here at our uh, uh, comprehensive uh, stroke center. Let's see. Somebody raised their hand. Cannot see them though. Okay. Um, if you if you have a question, just uh, shoot it through the Q and A or through the uh, chat function, and I'll address it. Uh, so the the treatments available here are also, you know, as I discussed, the IVTPA, mechanical thrombectomy for uh, acute ischemic stroke, 
uh, and obviously secondary prevention of all the etiologies. And we'll talk about all these as the day goes by about our ability or our medical treatments, uh, interventional treatments, and also uh, secondary prevention of stroke. On the hemorrhagic stroke side, we'll talk a, a lot about subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, which is really uh, the majority of, of the interventionally treated uh, hemorrhagic strokes, although we see a, a fair amount of hemorrhagic strokes uh, across uh, the spectrum uh, of, uh, of these pathologies. And, and we treat every, you know, we treat them both with endovascular approaches and also open approaches, surgical clipping, bypass, whatever have you, and all the etiologies are addressed here. You'll see a uh, tremendous lineup of specialties speaking to you today, but these are all the specialties that are really participating in the care of the stroke patient, neurology, neurosurgery, neurointervention, neurocritical care, neuroradiology, emergency medicine, and physical medicine rehabilitation. So we try to include folks from every single one of these specialties uh, to give you today uh, uh, an understanding of, uh, of uh, what goes on in our comprehensive stroke center. This is pretty much uh, how we function at Good Samaritan Hospital. The patient is in the center of our attention and multiple different teams are coming uh, uh, in the, to the care of the patient. Uh, and uh, this, this, uh, you know, this kind of a universe and the patient and the family are in the middle of it. And we have stroke neurology, interventional, emergency room, neurosurgery, neuroradiology, uh, neuro ICU, kind of all being coordinated together. Uh, the education and, uh, uh, and, and benchmarking is really transmitted through the units, through unit stroke champions who are nurses that are particularly interested in stroke and really are representing uh, everything we stand for and also are trying to uh, uh, get the education for the new guidelines and everything else to our stroke units. And then the whole team is integrated by our phenomenal stroke coordinator team, uh, lead by Karen Antaki on the, uh, on the stroke coordination side, Rich Happy on the data side, and, and Vinny Angular on, uh, uh, as the overarching uh, uh, head of quality. Transitions of care are very important for us. Uh, you know, as I said, stroke is a, a continuum, a, a problem that, that's addressed in a continuum, meaning uh, it can be, uh, if, if there's any breakdown in the care of the stroke patient outside of the hospital, before or after the care is delivered, you will have issues with, uh, with that patient. That patient might go back into the hospital and you can be in the vicious cycle of constantly not being able to deliver care. And so we have this pre-hospital, in-hospital, post-hospital continuum of care, and we're making sure that those transitions happen seamlessly. And uh, that happens through care coordinators. And, and so care coordinators uh, are, uh, are these uh, 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 nurses that are able to understand exactly what's going on with these patients and, and transition them to the appropriate care. Our uh, hub-and-spoke model is... Uh, our hub and spoke model is, is uh, based on Good Samaritan Hospital uh, being uh, at the center, as I said, and then other sister hospitals transferring cases to Good Samaritan Hospital um, for comprehensive stroke care. Now, this model is based on the assumption that you have very strong sister facilities, and we do. Uh, all our facilities are uh, primary stroke centers certified both by the Joint Commission and the Department of Health, uh, and some of them are advanced primary stroke centers. And, and what that means is that they have the ability to identify stroke cases, triage them appropriately, administer TPA if that's needed, and then transition these patients through seamless transfers to Good Samaritan Hospital Medical Center. What is really key here is that um, the, those, those transitions are seamless and also our sister hospitals are actually some of the best performing hospitals in the United States when it comes to percentage of TPA administration. So this model has worked great for us. Since creating the Comprehensive Stroke Center, we've seen a steady increase in the stroke volume uh, in our system. And, and that really is a reflection of the good care that's been provided here when it comes uh, to stroke. Now, the other pillar of what we do is quality improvement, right? So clinical care without without uh, uh, checks and balances or without quality improvement uh, is really uh, pointless. So uh, we pay a lot of attention to that. And I, I, I mentioned the team that makes it happen, Karen, Rich, um, Vinny, among other people. There's, a, there's a, a lot larger team obviously behind this, but, but these folks are the face of the operation. So there's multiple meetings and initiatives and quality control um, uh, pathways for us to make sure that every patient every time receives the best care. 
uh, you'll see here a bunch of them listed, uh, but those, those meetings are monthly, bi-weekly, uh, or what have you, and they're all local at Good Samaritan Hospital, but also uh, in a broader sense, we have monthly stroke coordinator meetings across CHS facilities, and that's very important because we all learn from each other. Uh, us being a comprehensive stroke center doesn't mean that we cannot learn from a uh, Joint Commission survey in a primary stroke center. So constantly, there's learning and interaction uh, and I think the, the stroke coordinators work in a very collegial way uh, to make that happen. Now, as we're approaching our surveys, we're always intensifying our education and have patient tracers, meaning our quality team is on the ground, talking to the people, making sure that uh, everybody's participating and also learning and getting ready uh, for these surveys. As I said, our Nurse Stroke Champions uh, is, is one of those programs that uh, has seen tremendous success and I think has been one of... Um, one of the great ideas that our stroke coordinator, Karen Antaki, had about getting the word out and getting uh, people engaged. So we identified nurses that are particularly interested in stroke care and then use them as a conduit to, to get that education, that benchmarking to the floor. Uh, and, and so that allows uh, to break the hierarchy and kind of uh, you know, make stroke education available readily to everybody uh, very quickly, uh, breaking down barriers and making sure the institution, especially for a disease like stroke that transpires all, all, all departments, uh, that that education is available in every floor. Even if uh, these folks are in a surgical unit or what have you, where uh, stroke patients are not taken care of often, but, but strokes can happen in these units for inpatients or sometimes patients can end up there because um, our neuro ICU or our step down, step down unit are full. Um, the other component of our program is research. Um, you know, as I said, we offer contemporary clinical care. We make sure that clinical care is quality controlled. Most importantly, though, we want to look into the future, and research is what allows us to do that uh, and really provide uh, solutions for stroke patients that do not only apply to today, but uh, are looking into tomorrow. So there's multiple research studies that are going on at our comprehensive stroke center. First of all, we're collaborating with the Population Health Research Institute in New York to create uh, uh, studies at the population health level uh, that are, uh, uh, their goal would be to understand, uh, uh, you know, uh, pretty much what happens to the individual through looking at the population. Uh, and this is large data set analysis, and we have a lot of uh, knowledge of that. Now, Another study that we have involves shared decision-making with patients. So, you know, when you're trying to, to make a decision about say brain aneurysm treatments, we're engaging patients through decision aids and we want them to participate in the decision-making. And then we uh, are uh, uh, trying, we're grading how well the decision-making process was performed. We've had one of the first point of care MRI machines for stroke patients in the country here, uh, the Hyperfine uh, in collaboration with the emergency room and Dr. Uh, Chris Ray are from there. Uh, that was stationed initially in the neuro ICU, and then we had a second machine in the emergency room. This, this was a, a fantastic uh, uh, a study, mainly because we had that machine even before it was FDA approved. Now it's FDA approved. It's in every major hospital in the United States, Mass General I saw recently, University of Chicago, University of Miami. So this, this has spread like wildfire, but Good Samaritan Hospital was at the forefront. At the beginning, it was just uh, Yale New Haven Hospital and Good Samaritan Hospital in the entire United States. So really a tremendous work being done here by everybody. The small aneurysm project is a study where we're trying to identify the natural history of smaller brain aneurysms, those that are sub three millimeters. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of data on that out there. There's, there's some folks that are very aggressively treating smaller aneurysms, other folks that do not. And so we're trying to identify really what is the risk profile of these patients and how much we should be doing uh, for this population. And most, most recently, uh, we were approved by the, by the FDA to be a clinical site for um, uh, a, a, a study on uh, brain aneurysms for a clinical trial on brain aneurysms for a new device. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, that's extremely exciting. And uh, we'll, we'll know more about that. As I said, you know, the Population Health Research Institute, the option grids, this is the point of care MRI uh, that, uh, that I had discussed before. And uh, this is the clinical trial of a new stent that allows the treatment of brain aneurysms in uh, revolutionary uh, ways that we haven't seen before. Now, 
our research has produced a lot of publications um, and I've highlighted just a few that really have been instrumental uh, in, uh, in changing clinical practice. And you see one of our older papers in 2012, for example, um, directed people to go directly to angiography, skipping CTA uh, uh, when uh, you know, you're identifying subarachnoid hemorrhages that are non-traumatic. And we had some criteria based on age and other things, but uh, at, at uh, uh, the, the bottom line was that this really changed uh, the outlook uh, of, uh, of what we do uh, for these patients. Now, more uh, studies here. You see uh, our studies have been impactful in fairly large journals like Radiology or the Journal of the American Heart Association uh, and uh, some most recent ones in JAMA. Uh, uh, and I'm going to show you a couple of uh, our circulation, uh, British Medical Journal on carotid disease and most recently on stroke about COVID-19 and ischemic stroke. Uh, now, th these are figures for some of the studies that we've published that really changed the outlook uh, or, or actually the practice uh, of uh, stroke care. Now you see, for example, in this study, uh, we tried to identify uh, what is the best destination for a patient having a stroke. So, you know, th there's always a question whether a primary stroke center or a comprehensive stroke center is the way to go when it comes to a stroke. And that really we cannot answer uh, yet but based on what we have, but, but, but this was a study before comprehensive stroke centers came to be. And it really said that folks should be going to the primary stroke center if they're within 90 minutes of that and not going to the nearest hospital. And this is what really affected New York state regulation that now mandates folks to go to the primary stroke center. Uh, and and we'll, we'll have a lot of discussion coming uh, towards the end of the conference about what is the appropriate disposition of stroke patients. Uh, this was a study, for, for example, from the Dartmouth Atlas, where for the first time we demonstrated uh, the rates across the country of subarachnoid hemorrhages uh, and other cerebrovascular pathologies. And this is for our study uh, most recently on COVID-19 and stroke, where we demonstrated with a green, you can see the, out, the increase in COVID-19 cases, over 3,000 COVID cases. And then you can see at the bottom the stroke TIA and uh, myocardial infarction cases. So you can see this is a steady trend or a decrease in those cases during the pandemic, or although there was a lot of publicity maybe uh, uh, on either side, but this was kind of what we were seeing in our uh, institutions. And lastly, our last uh, pillar is education. So, you know, as I said, we provide clinical care, we quality control it, we look into the future with research, but we're also an outward looking institution and we want to educate the community, we want to educate providers, and we want to give back uh, to the community. And today is one of those functions we're offering uh, uh, CMEs, but, but most importantly, we want to engage the community. And you know, we're, we might be socially distanced and not having this conference like we like to have it in person, uh, but uh, we are really, we want to get together with you guys even uh, through this uh, uh, venue. Uh, these are some of the educational initiatives that uh, we're uh, performed in the last uh, year or so, actually maybe two years. Now you can see that uh, after uh, after this particular conference, everything else was a Zoom webinar. Obviously, uh, COVID got to us, so we had to change our ways. But uh, as I said, we're committed to education, so it doesn't matter what avenue we use, we will always uh, be out there educating people. Now more of those events out there, these are all just for the community. Um, this is a picture for one of those events. Uh, where we're trying to get the word out and get people engaged. Because as I said, stroke is about every single component. Uh, if the community doesn't understand stroke and they cannot identify the signs and symptoms of stroke, they will not go to the hospital on time. They will not get the right care. So uh, for example, educating physicians and EMS providers is great, but it's not adequate to get uh, to change the outlook of this disease. So we need to educate the community first and foremost uh, about identifying uh, the symptoms of stroke uh, fast, right? Face, arm, speech, it's time to call 911. So, so we're trying to get the word out and to get the word of the American Heart Association out there. Other ways we're using uh, to educate the community, uh, for example, Hip Hop Stroke is a program we have in collaboration with Columbia, uh, where uh, it's actually an NIH funded study by Columbia and we are one of the sites where what's uh, happening uh, is that we, um, we are trying to uh, uh, we, we are trying to get the word for stroke to, hospital, to, to schools, and we had a primary school in Smithtown participating. Again, this was an initiative that was uh, 
piloted uh, there, and it was uh, uh, the the it was spearheaded by our stroke coordinator Karen Antike, and I think we had very good results to try to get the word out for stroke through um, uh, through educating kids with, who then bring it to their homes. Uh, EMS engagement is particularly important. Again, we have a lot of EMS events. Obviously, we switched into uh, online uh, lectures now and in collaboration. The most recent one was uh, with St. Joseph's and uh, Dr. Matthew there, who's, uh, um, who's very, uh, 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 he, who's who's uh, you know very passionate about stroke, and he'll you'll be hearing from him later today. It is one of those events where we're talking to EMS. We're out there, as I said, we're trying to get the word out. You'll see us in magazines or on um, uh, in on the radio or or um, uh, in newspapers and other uh, avenues. And we're also trying to get the word out in uh, in the Spanish community, the Spanish speaking community, which is. Uh, very big around the Good Samaritan Hospital because these folks generally have limited access to education. So, so we're trying to get the word out and engage people. As I said, we're big into survivors and we've been uh, supporting uh, the National Stroke Association, now American Heart Association, Comeback Trail or the American Heart Association Stroke and Heart Walk uh, since 2017. And we will continue to support uh, them in that mission. Most importantly, I think uh, we're extremely proud of our support group, uh, which is the only comprehensive support group in the South Shore Long Island, probably very, very unique in, uh, in what we do. We're engaging the patients and we're also engaging the families. Uh, we um, are, are co-branding and we're partnering with the Lisa Colagrossi Foundation when it comes to that. Uh, the, the Lisa Colagrossi Foundation uh, is, uh, as I said before, a, one of the most prominent foundations when it comes to brain aneurysm awareness. They, they spread the word uh, and they've done tremendous amount of, of education when it comes to brain aneurysms. And we've, we've been invited and we've, we've spoken to their gala before in New York City, a very, uh, very well promoted and, and uh, uh, impactful event. But this support group really, uh, you know, brings all our patients together, not just patients uh, that we've operated on, but patients across Long Island and sometimes even from out of state that come to hear other stories and 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 get um, uh, and and get help uh, in their path to recovery. Even even the patients that have done great and uh, have uh, uh, and have uh, you know uh, recovered. Sometimes they have survivor's guilt, and uh, they need they need help uh, in their process of recovering. This is one of our support groups. Obviously, we, we're publishing this with the uh, with the permission of the patients uh, here. Uh, as I said, we're partnering with other institutions, the Lisa Cole Gross Found or other foundations. The Lisa Cole Gross Foundation is a foundation that we work with very closely. And Todd Crawford, the uh, the founder of the foundation, will be talking later today. This is a foundation on brain aneurysm, so it'll be on the second part of our conference, uh, which focuses on brain aneurysms. Uh, and uh, as I said, we've spoken to their uh, to their gala uh, in New York City, and another foundation where. Uh, we're working on uh, working. Uh, we're working on creating a relationship with is the Paige Elizabeth Keeley Foundation, and that's a foundation on pediatric AVM treatments. And our goal is to create a screening program for these uh, arteriovenous malformations in the pediatric population and for uh, uh, diseases that can cause that and really get ahead of uh, a devastating disease for the pediatric population. So we're very proud to be partnering with these national organizations. Uh, and that's a testament to the hard work that's been done uh, in Good Samaritan Hospital, but it, by everybody involved uh, at all levels. Uh, our work has been recognized uh, in the last few years. Since 2017, we've had uh, Get With Guidelines Awards. And most recently, we are at the at the uh, most elite category when it comes to that. We've been recognized by the American Heart Association, by the Long Island Elite, and by the National Stroke Association. Uh, we're in social media. A lot of you guys are following us or part of our um, social uh, uh, media groups. And so we're on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, and Facebook. So we're trying to get the word out. Uh, the conference right now uh, is uh, live on Facebook and we will also uh, provide it on YouTube. Uh, when it is completed. Uh, there's a few firsts uh, in our program. Obviously, when we came uh, here to start this program, there was 
there was not a comprehensive stroke center in the South Shore of Long Island, then we quickly uh, became a comprehensive stroke center. We performed the first CT perfusion of the South Shore of Long Island and the first mechanical thrombectomy here, treatment of aneurysms and AVMs. We had the first uh, and only neurointensive care unit in the South Shore of Long Island. As a matter of fact, when we opened our neuro ICU, we were the first neuro ICU, freestanding neuro ICU in Suffolk County. Other institutions later on developed neurointensive care units actually this year. So about three years after we opened our first neuro ICU. Uh, we were the first ones to use the Atlas stent for coiling of intracranial aneurysms uh, in New York. Uh, and then we were the first ones to use a flow diverting stent, a new treatment technology uh, for uh, the treatment, surpass flow diverting stent for uh, the treatment of brain aneurysms on Long Island. And right now, we had the first commercial application of Evolve stent in the United States. Uh, now, we, as I said, we have a comprehensive support group, which is the first one of its kind. Uh, and um, we are currently the only comprehensive stroke center in Suffolk County to be certified both by the Joint Commission and uh, by the Department of Health. So a lot of great achievements for everybody involved in this program. There is not a single person that I can um, single out uh, about any of these achievements. These, these have been uh, teamwork that started uh, from the folks on the ground all the way to, to administration, locally at Good Samaritan Hospital, but also centrally at CHS. And it was the vision of the folks at CHS and Dr. Shaughnessy and Dr. Gersey that allowed us to really build this program uh, and uh, with their support really create something unique. Um, you know, after, you know, kind of this overview, I want to thank you and uh, really uh, wish you a great day today. Uh, I'm, I'll be here all day if you guys have any questions and I'll be participating in a lot of these talks. I would have loved this to have been in person, but uh, it is what it is. Uh, we will try to make the most of it uh, this way. Uh, and uh, uh, with that, I'm going to see if there are any questions. Okay. Yeah, we can take that offline maybe. All right. So I see a couple of questions that I can possibly take offline. Jason, right? Yeah. All right. So I'm going to move to the next speaker if I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now. Stop sharing. All righty, I think uh, Dr. Marison, right? Mm -hmm. All right, Dr. Marison, I'm gonna I'm gonna unmute you here. Okay, am I unmuted? You are unmuted. You are good to go. And uh, I will be um, I'll be sharing my screen with your uh, presentation. Um, so I'm having trouble getting my uh, talk up online. Uh, for God knows what reason, I tried two or three computers so far, and I'm not. Maybe you could just put it up. Yeah, so yeah, that yeah. I can, absolutely. So that I can see it. Otherwise, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm uh, sharing it right now. Here we go. Let's see. It's happening. Oh, actually, you know what? Let me get out of this. I'll get out of this one. And here we go. Can you see it, Bruce? Great. And you'll be able to uh, of course. Move, move it for me because I don't think I can now. I can move it for you. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, Kimon asked me uh, to uh, speak uh, this year about a, a few different issues, including the, the first talk, which will be advances in, in medical management of acute ischemic stroke, in addition to secondary um, prevention of uh, recurrent stroke. Um, not sure what I did to have um, made Kimon uh, made me give two talks today uh, to him, but whatever it is, Kimon, I'm sorry. And um, very talented, Bruce. Yeah. So um, anyway, thank you everyone for joining. I, before I start, I just want to say that um, Kimon, am I looking into the camera? You're good. Okay. I just wanted to say before starting that um, I think what you've seen in the past 10 or 15 minutes or so that uh, Kimon has presented uh, is an extraordinary, and I mean extraordinary, comprehensive stroke center with a great uh, hub and spoke uh, model that could not have happened uh, if it were not for Kimon's uh, diligence and, and hard work. And not only that, he built this uh, program up in record time, and I mean record time. So. I think Kimon, uh, thank you for, for all you do. And um, I think that uh, everybody should just be aware of, 
of uh, you know what what you have done for uh, CHS uh, in in general and for Good Sam in particular. So I just wanted to point that out and give Kimon his due. And let's move on. I'm going to be talking about advances in the medical management of acute ischemic stroke uh, this morning. I uh, just wanted to give a little bit of background. I'm probably going to move quickly. I have a lot of slides, so I apologize. And any questions, I guess we could take after or offline or whatever. But uh, just to go over quickly some of the epidemiology, stroke is the fifth leading cause of death in the U.S. and most common cause of long-term disability. Um, when do we think about stroke? When a patient presents, of course, with an acute onset of a common neurologic deficit, sometimes it's not so common. The most common ones we see are uh, hemiparesis, hemisensory loss, slurred speech or language deficits, ataxia, visual field deficits. So really, uh, you know, any, any aspect uh, of patient functioning, because that's what the brain does. If, pa if patients present with an acute uh, deficit relating to that, we think stroke. And uh, just to, to reiterate a little bit of what uh, Kimon said earlier about the time of onset uh, being critical because we know that any of our strategies for cerebral reperfusion uh, uh, cannot uh, work properly uh, if time is lost and uh, every 15, in every 15 minutes lost, there is a uh, significant increase in the likelihood of the patient having long-term uh, disability. So I think that's important. Next. Thanks. Uh, about 795,000 people in the United States have strokes. Um, that should be per year. I'm sorry, it's not on the slide, but everybody, uh, that should be per year. About 600,000 are first or new strokes, and almost 200,000 of them are recurrent strokes. Uh, as I said, strokes is the fifth leading cause of uh, death in the United States, and it's the second leading cause of death globally. Males are preferentially uh, affected as far as risk factors go greater risk for um, non-Caucasian uh, uh, patients, African-Americans, Asians, and Hispanic. Next. So just briefly uh, to go over a couple of the uh, 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 basics, um, there are several types of stroke. The three main uh, types are ischemic stroke, hemorrhagic stroke, and subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, and I think just by looking at this slide, you can see how important the burden of treating ischemic stroke is because of how common it is. Um, you know, it really <clears throat> has to be on the forefront in the, the, the uh, uh, advances made in the past 25 years in treating acute ischemic stroke. When I was, uh, you know, a resident and uh, uh, even when I was a medical student and a resident, you know, there wasn't a heck of a lot we could, we could do for these people. Um, and boy, have the times changed. I think anybody who takes care of stroke patients now would, would agree that this has really just been an amazing uh, uh, part of our medical um, uh, technological growth. Uh, next. So acute ischemic stroke, general medical management uh, includes calling a stroke alert or its equivalent. I believe it's a code orange at Good Sam at, at St. Catharines where I am. It's a stroke alert, getting patients to medical attention, including nursing, ER docs, and stroke neurologists. And we do this either with a neurologist in person or via telemedicine, uh, which uh, uh, four, I think, of our hospitals are now uh, hooked into um, uh, Good Sam, St. Catharines, St. Charles, and St. Joe's, and I think that Mercy is is on its way, uh, which is great because we can get a neurologist uh, to the patient's bedside literally within minutes, uh, which is difficult to do uh, otherwise unless you have residents or, or stroke fellows. Um, and most importantly, getting a stat CAT scan of the brain and a CT angiogram of the head and neck vessels to look for large vessel occlusion. Next. Uh, we quickly go through the relevant medical history, including the NIHSS score. Uh, we have to question whether or not the patient is on any blood thinners, anticoagulants, antiplatelet drugs, and then, of course, vital signs uh, just to establish uh, their stability, uh, blood pressure in particular, pulse rate, and rhythm. Next. And once these things uh, uh, happen, we can decide as to whether or not the patient is a candidate for an intervention, whether it's a medical intervention with intravenous TPA or a mechanical intervention 
uh, with Dr. Beckles and, and his team, uh, that's what needs to be decided. Uh, and that's the big benefit of Telestroke. Uh, that they, at the end of the day, I, I think the most important thing that they wind up writing in their uh, impression or plan is whether or not the patient is a candidate for an intervention. Um, and if they're not, then we can move on to, uh, you know, treating other complications of their stroke. And if they are, then we move ahead and, and, and treat them with that. Um, the options, of course, are intravenous uh, TPA. Um, well, and I'll talk a little bit about connect the place at the end of uh, the talk. Um, mechanical thrombectomy, of course, and that's what Kimon is such an expert at. Determinants of the severity of uh, the deficits are by the NIHSS scale, which I'm not going to go into too much. I think I'm, I'm hoping that most people um, who uh, are, are with us today know what that is. Uh, it's, it's basically a score. Uh, the lower the score, the more functional the patient is. Um, however, there are exceptions in patients who have low scores, but a debilitating deficit, we have to think about intervention, including uh, if, if a patient has aphasia, acute ataxia, or a visual field cut depending on what they do, if there's someone who speaks for a living, if there's somebody who drives a cab for a living, we need to aggressively manage their symptoms even though they may have a low uh, score. So that's an important point to keep in mind. It's not just for the patients who can't speak and are hemiplegic. Next. Uh, the diagnosis uh, of acute ischemic stroke is, of course, based on the clinical presentation of the patient. Uh, we do a CT of the brain without contrast or rule out hemorrhage. Um, I, should, I, I should have mentioned, and I didn't here, but the other thing is CT of the brain without contrast. Not only does it rule out hemorrhage, but it can show early signs of uh, stroke. And I think everybody is probably familiar with the aspect score that we use uh, from 0 uh, to 10 or from 1 to 10. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, whether or not a score of 10 means that the CAT scan of the brain is completely normal. And as you go down in numbers, it means that there's a signs of acute ischemic uh, uh, change. And if it becomes less uh, than seven, that's probably uh, a patient who will not do well with our interventions. CT angiography of the head and neck vessels, sorry. <clears throat> and of course, uh, I know they're doing this down at, at, at Good Sam uh, MR, MRI with uh, diffusion and ADC weighted uh, sequences um, and flare um, should also be mentioned because when we're looking for a mismatch, uh, we use diffusion and, and, and flare images uh, and can make decisions about um, uh, intervening on patients based on uh, a mismatch. Um, uh, using those MRI sequences. So we have a lot of tools that, that we can use next. Uh, of course, <laughs> ABCs, airway support, ventilatory assistance, and those who have uh, depressed level of consciousness or bulbar uh, dysfunction to protect their airway, supplemental oxygen uh, to maintain uh, O2 sats greater than 94%. Um, in patients who aren't hypoxic, we don't have any great data uh, to, in using, uh, in the use of, of uh, oxygen via nasal cannula, but often we do that anyway. Next. Uh, as far as the general medical management goes, um, of course, establishing an IV line um, and uh, dripping uh, either normal saline or uh, 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 hypertonic uh, saline um, at, at, at the rates noted once you see a kilogram an hour. We should always avoid hypotonic fluids, half normal and D5W, because we don't want to exacerbate any potential cerebral edema, which may not be a problem immediately, but within uh, a couple of days, two or three days, it, it, it will certainly be a problem for large infarcts. Blood pressure management for a patient to be a TPA candidate, the uh, <clears throat> Blood pressure has to be below 185 over 110, and then after we administer it, it has to be below 180 over 105. Next. Um, we don't treat uh, systolic pressures of less than 220 until we see what a CAT scan shows. And at that point, if there is a hemorrhage, of course, we treat aggressively. And if not, and they have an acute deficit, we don't treat the blood pressure. And that's this notion of permissive hypertension. Um, which uh, is is something that you know we've we've used before uh, uh, IVTPA, but the notion that the body's response to uh, an acute infarct in the brain is to increase uh, blood pressure so that the uh, perfusion pressure can be maintained in the area of brain that has lost its autoregulation. 
um, and lowering blood pressure can actually uh, be detrimental and lead to uh, neurologic deterioration and deficits. Uh, again, those are for patients who are not candidates for an intervention. Next. Blood pressure management, do not treat acute hypertension um, uh, uh, if, that shouldn't say unless, I apologize, that's a typo. Uh, it should say if the patients can come in an acute coronary ischemia, uh, cardiogenic pulmonary edema, aortic dissection, uh, hypertensive end organ damage, including if the patient is encephalopathic or hypertensive neuropathy. And uh, systolic blood pressure, I always get looks from nurses when I, when I tell them don't treat for uh, uh, stock uh, greater than 220, diastolic uh, greater than uh, 120, um, uh, because that seems insane. Um, but it, it, those are the uh, American Stroke and Heart Association guidelines for not treating uh, acute strokes um, uh, in patients uh, who, uh, who are not candidates for intervention. And of course, intracerebral hemorrhage or hemorrhagic infarct. So um, on that slide, again, it's do not treat hypertension if not unless, my apologies. Next. Acute malignant hypertension. Um, I'll just go through some of these you know, general things uh, quickly. IV, uh, 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 nicardipine, uh, cardizem at five milligrams an hour with titration, labetalol. Uh, they can be uh, bolused and, or mini bolused and then have uh, interval uh, dosing up to 200. And I know the new favorite of our ICU uh, docs is uh, Cleveprex. Next. Rapid AFib, of course, you may kill two birds with one stone um, using uh, drugs like Cartizem, which will lower pressure and slow down uh, heart rate in patients in rapid AFib. Next. A temperature hypothermia should be treated, of course, um, and uh, uh, aggressively with antipyretics. Uh, uh, I, I, sometimes uh, it's been questioned in patients who have massive uh, infarcts whether or not hypo induced hypothermia would be useful, like we do for patients who have a global uh, acute hypoxic or ischemic uh, brain injury from a cardiac arrest and things, uh, pulmonary arrest. Uh, and the benefits are just not clear at this time. I know it's just uh, an area that's being studied actively. Next. Uh, blood sugar, uh, blood glucose less than 60 should be treated. Of course, less than 50 really should be treated. Uh, and hyperglycemia should also be aggressively managed. Uh, you can develop focal deficits from either profound hypoglycemia, even hyperglycemia, blood sugar is greater than 400. Uh, both things are rare, but we want to make sure that that stuff is uh, treated and ruled out before we uh, give patients a potentially risky treatment. Next. And intravenous uh, uh, thrombolysis is the only proven medical therapy to decrease deficits in long-term disability. Any patient with a presumed deficit within uh, three to four and a half hours is a candidate to the four and a half hour window has certain exclusions. Um, inclusion, exclusion criteria met next. IV TPA, uh, the benefit uh, of IV uh, uh, TPA has been uh, proven um, and because, of course, time to treatment is so important, um, we do not want to delay and wait for patients to get better while they're laying there and, and, and hope that they improve. And even if they improve a little bit, we also don't want to delay giving patients IV TPA because they, we don't know what their deficits are going to be if we do nothing. We know they have a better chance if we give them IV TPA. So even in patients who are improving but still have significant deficits, they need to be treated. And of course, we have to be prepared for complications. Um, uh, the ECAS trial uh, uh, quotes a 6.4 risk of uh, significant intracranial hemorrhage and angioedema, uh, especially in patients on ACE inhibitors too. Next. Uh, lab work, we do not delay imaging or treatment waiting for test results. If the patient is not anticoagulated or have a coagulopathy suspected, we do not wait for uh, coagulation studies or platelet counts. The only thing we need is a finger stick glucose showing a blood sugar greater than 50. Next. Inclusion criteria, uh, acute ischemic stroke with a definable deficit, onset within three or four and a half hours, depending and age greater than 18. Uh, next, sorry. Uh, this is not an exhaustive uh, list, so uh, you know there there may be other circumstances that are, are worth discussing. Uh, you know, uh, uh, just as an example, I didn't 
put down what we do with pregnant women, but I just wanted to give you an overview of some of the updates based on the most recent American Stroke Association uh, guidelines and um, uh, the, 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 uh, the data uh, that supports it. Within the three and a half, within three to four and a half hour window, uh, there are exclusions for age greater than 80, and IHS has greater than 25, meaning a big stroke. Uh, oral anticoagulation, regardless of the INR, which is not the same in patients uh, who would be in the zero to three hour, and patients who have a history of diabetes and the prior ischemic stroke. I would say that I, I myself am guilty of having uh, treated patients who might fall into this uh, three to four and a half hour window if they're 82 in great shape and, uh, you know, they have a significant deficit. I, I you know, these are, uh, I, I, for me, these are relative uh, contraindications um, and have to be taken as such. A couple other uh, uh, issues, head trauma or acute ischemic stroke within three months, uh, symptoms suggesting a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Some of these are, are intuitive, obviously. A prior history of ICH or an intraaxial intracranial neoplasm, not the 90-year-old lady who you found an incidental meningioma on because she was dizzy. Um, blood pressure, uh, of course, we talked about that, and recent uh, intracranial spinal surgery within three months. Next. Active internal bleeding, uh, again, all these things I think are intuitive, uh, but the specific numbers, platelet counts less than 100, IV heparin within 48 hours, and an elevated PTT. If patient is on a therapeutic dose of Lovenox uh, for whatever reason, um, the history of DVT or they're in AFib, that is a contraindication. Uh, if they are on a uh, uh, non-therapeutic but prophylactic dose, then they can be given uh, IV TPA if the circumstances uh, warrant it. Anticoagulation with an INR, I'm talking about Coumadin in here, uh, with an INR of uh, greater than 1.7 or PT uh, uh, greater than 15 seconds. No ACK use, which is the new oral anticoagulants, blood glucose less than 50. We spoke about that in CAT scan, showing evidence of a large ischemic stroke with multi-level involvement early on. In other words, if you have a large hypodensity that's affecting more than a third of a cerebral hemisphere, multi-lobar, uh, we've missed the boat. Uh, it's, it's too late to treat. Well, that's true. Next. Relative exclusion criterion, uh, these, a lot of these uh, ha have changed uh, over uh, the past five years or so, um, but basically uh, seizure at onset with possible post deficits, uh, the original uh, uh, um, uh, guidelines said that those patients who could have a post ictal TODS paralysis should not be treated. Uh, now it's really left to the discretion of the neurologist as to whether or not they feel that it is a post ictal deficit versus uh, uh, you know, a stroke. And that can be tricky. Major surgery at trauma in 14 days, GI or GU bleeding within 21 days, recent MI. Um, next. I'm sorry if this slide is small. Uh, it's my fault um, because I couldn't figure out how to make it bigger. But dosing uh, of IBTPA uh, 0.9 milligrams per kg to a maximum of 90 milligrams, uh, no matter how big the patient is, they can't get more than 90 milligrams. 10% is given as a bolus over one to two minutes. And then the remainder is infused as a drip over an hour. And then blood pressure management, uh, as noted, 15 minutes from the start to infusion, uh, then 30 minutes uh, for six hours, then uh, um, every hour for 16 hours for to get to 25 hours, but pressure has to be maintained less than 180 over 105. No antiplatelets or anticoagulants should be given uh, within 24 hours of administration um, to reduce the risk of bleeding. So even if the patient has atrial fibrillation and you feel and it's new and you feel that they had an embolic stroke, um, you we, we would defer that. Next. Um, so the, uh, I, I think in the era of uh, um, uh, stroke care in, in, uh, in the year 2020, the most important question is was whether or not the patient uh, ha has a, a large vessel occlusion as a candidate for mechanical thrombectomy. But we should always note that if, and this, had, this uh, comes down to a lot of what uh, Kimon had mentioned earlier about um, uh, the drip and ship model versus the mothership model, uh, meaning that if the patient uh, is a candidate for IVTPA, but they have an, a large vessel occlusion, T 
the TPA should always be administered uh, first um, because that's what's indicated. Uh, sometimes the IV TPA is able to break through uh, a clot. It's not common, but if it does, then the patient may not need mechanical thrombectomy. So we're still using IV TPA even in patients who are candidates for mechanical thrombectomy. And of course, after the four and a half hour window, then we don't use IV TPA and they'd only be candidates for uh, uh, um, uh, um, mechanical thrombectomy, sorry. Patients outside the four and a half hour window documented LVO, uh, CPA uh, with the clinical symptoms that correlate should of course be brought to the cath lab for Dr. Beckelis and Missios uh, to handle. Um, being outside the ischemic stroke window for IV TPA, anterior LVO, all of this is based on trials over it, which were confirmed over the past several years, the Dawn and Diffuse uh, 3 trial in particular. Um, and in selected patients who present within a late uh, window, 16 to 24 hours to meet a uh, criterion used in that study, mechanical thrombectomy is felt to be reasonable. Next. Um, excluded patients, meaning patients who don't get IV TPA should be given uh, aspirin uh, within 48 hours, um, as that has been shown to decrease mortality and recurrent stroke in the first year. Uh, IV uh, heparin is generally not administered to ischemic stroke patients. There are potential exceptions to this, all of which are uh, associated with very, uh, most of which I should say are associated with very poor data to support, um, including stroke and evolution, those with high grade large vessel atherostenosis, arterial dissections, crescendo TIA, suspected uh, venous sinus thrombosis. Uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that people who treat stroke patients commonly, uh, like myself, have uh, from time to time uh, had patients with these type of evolving uh, symptoms or particular uh, pathophysiologies and used intravenous heparin, but in general, in general, it's it's not recommended. Next, um, minor. What about minor deficits? So this is always a question that comes up and was addressed uh, to some degree in the uh, Prisms trial in 2018, um, which, without getting into details, concluded that in patients who have minor deficits, which they defined as uh, an IHSS score of less than five administration of TPA was no better than aspirin in increasing the likelihood of favorable functional outcome at 90 days. There were some limitations to the study, and I know that there certainly are uh, people who, some people who would still use IV TPA, but I think that uh, in, in large part in patients who have uh, mild, uh, especially small vessel ischemic strokes, uh, that, you know, especially if they're not on any antiplatelet therapy, that it may be reasonable to load them with aspirin and Plavix uh, when they present. Next. Uh, we talked about this uh, mild but disabling symptoms, uh, but not disabling, should not be treated. Um, this, I think, is just what we talked about next. Uh, complications of IV TPA briefly. I didn't want to get too much into this, but um, intracerebral hemorrhage. Kimon, how much time do I have? Of course, I can't hear Hold you. On. But... I'm muting myself. Uh, you keep going, Bruce. Okay. I'm we, just going to keep going. We were, uh, we were a little ahead of time because the American Heart Association folks are going to talk a little later. So we're a little ahead of Great. schedule. Thank you, okay. Time. So complications of, in, of intravenous TPA, uh, uh, obviously the most dreaded complication, which based on the initial trial was 6.4% uh, is intracerebral hemorrhage. What do you do when that happens? You stop the infusion, you get the appropriate blood work. The patients need to be treated with cryoprecipitate, tranexamic acid, and uh, heme and neurosurgery consults, of course. Uh, the other uh, major complication of IV TPA uh, can be angioedema, which if you've ever seen this is pretty uh, dramatic. Um, uh, the, the tongue swelling and airway protection issues are significant. Next. And it, it often it, this can uh, be, the patient can be at increased risk of this, especially if they're on ACE inhibitors or ready for hypertension. Um, the treatment includes steroids, Benadryl, um, uh, ranitidine, and if bad enough, epinephrine and intubation. Next. Uh, let's just talk briefly about acute ischemic stroke complications. Cerebral edema generally takes uh, two to three days to reach its peak. Three days is typically at, at its peak. Uh, 
the use of osmotic uh, therapy is reasonable uh, with 3% or 23.4 uh, hypertonic normal saline. Um, the patients should be uh, hyperventilated uh, if they are um, um, intubated. Uh, until a more uh, definitive therapy becomes available. Hypothermia and barbiturates are not recommended. Steroids should not be used for uh, 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 cerebral edema due to acute ischemic stroke. This is the old story about cytotoxic versus uh, vasogenic edema. And of course, cytotoxic edema, as would be seen in acute uh, ischemia, is not uh, treated with steroids, it doesn't work. Um, whereas with vasogenic edema from a large brain tumor or abscess or something of that nature, it may, or it does. So just to uh, hammer that point home. Next. In patients under 60s who deteriorate uh, within 48 hours uh, and have a large acute MCA uh, infarct uh, with significant swelling, midline shift, all the really bad things that we see, uh, decompressive uh, craniectomy uh, is a reasonable option. Um, I guess I would say more reasonable in patients with non-dominant hemispheric strokes because those who have dominant hemispheric strokes are going to be so uh, neurologically devastated that um, you, you, you know, we have to make sure that we're doing the right thing based on the patient's wishes and, and what the family wants, frankly. Um, recurrent seizures after a stroke, like any other recurrent seizure disorder, should be treated. We do not use prophylactic uh, uh, anti-epileptic drugs in patients with acute ischemic stroke. Next. Uh, I just wanted to speak a little bit about, uh, just to get to some of the more uh, cutting edge things uh, happening um, with regard to uh, medical management. Um, uh, a, a lot of uh, places outside the United States use uh, Tenecteplase as their thrombolytic, um, and it does have advantages, including uh, cost. It has greater fibrin specificity. It's got a longer half-life, and the patient doesn't need to have a drip after the initial bolus. Um, it's also been associated with low rates of non-cerebral hemorrhage and alteplase. Um, based on um, uh, meta-analyses of trials comparing the two, tenecteplase to alteplase, there really is no significant difference um, in, uh, in how the patient uh, evolves or, or if they die or uh, have significant deficits. Next. Um, in the New England Journal uh, in, in 2018, it was concluded that if uh, tenecteplase was administered before mechanical thrombectomy, uh, there was a higher incidence of cerebral uh, perfusion and better outcome than was without the place in acute ischemic stroke within four and a half hours. And based on the most recent trials, uh, the uh, guidelines uh, state that tenecteplase may be a reasonable option over out the place in patients who are going to be going for mechanical thrombectomy. Next. Uh, the role of dual antiplatelet therapy, this is going to overlap a little bit with the second talk that I'm going to be giving about the secondary uh, prevention of uh, recurrent uh, strokes, but um, I, this is a, a relatively new concept, you know, over the past couple of years that in patients who have progressive or fluctuating deficits uh, with uh, LVOs excluded um, and, and, you know, they're minor, so we don't feel comfortable giving them TPA. Uh, based on the PRISMS trial that we mentioned earlier, uh, it is a reasonable option to load them with 300 milligrams of clopidogrel uh, uh, and aspirin and keep them on that therapy, dual anti DAPT is dual antiplatelet therapy uh, for uh, 21 days, and then one of them may be discontinued, but the, uh, uh, the giving both of them within uh, the, the acute window um, reduces uh, uh, stroke risk, recurrent stroke, uh, compared with using aspirin alone at three months, 90 days. And uh, these recommendations are based on the CHANCE and POINT trials, uh, both of which are in the New England Journal of Medicine. The CHANCE was, I think, in 2013, and POINT was, 20, I think, 18. Um, so there is some data now to back up uh, this, this practice, which I, you know, myself use. Next. As far as anticoagulation goes, urgent anticoagulation patients who have uh, uh, severe uh, uh, either extracranial carotid, meaning carotid or vertebral or intracranial stenosis is really not well established. Uh, again, I, I'm sure at some point in, in the career of people who treat a lot of these patients, they have been urgently anticoagulated, but we really don't know uh, that that uh, is, is helpful. It just 
kind of makes sense. The usefulness of uh, novel oral anticoagulants in the acute setting is not established. Um, and um, uh, urgent anticoagulant, as we mentioned earlier, giving patients uh, uh, intravenous or subcutaneous heparin to prevent recurrent stroke uh, is not uh, recommended. Next, sorry. And that's the end of that talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bruce. Um, question for you. Yeah, do, what's, what's your take on uh, the kind of wake up stroke trial and uh, what we've seen with, um, you know, integrating uh, that into the guidelines, which I think was kind of fast. The most recent iteration of the guidelines, it, they came out with a recommendation that we should be doing MRIs and, uh, and uh, you know, getting um, treating patients based on I meant you mentioned before the, the obviously using diffusion and flare to identify uh, to identify mismatches, but but you know obviously the 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 impetus of this trial was you know for those folks that are wake up stroke and they're not a large vessel occlusion and they would be a candidate for TPA had we known that when the time of onset was would you treat them if you see a small stroke that's not completed in a flare diffusion comparison? And the recommendation was that we integrate in our workflow and, and we toyed a little bit at Get Sam about doing that and creating a separate code for these people. Uh, we even, you know, we were coming up with fancy names like code orange MRI or something, but obviously that requires you empty your MRI scanner, have it available 24 seven, have a tech there and then treat the patients. So I guess my question is twofold that, you know, is it, is the, is the juice worth the squeeze, you know, in terms of getting all that personnel and all these people on board, how many, how many of those do we see? And the second is, are you guys planning on doing it? Because we're, we're still debating, frankly, and with the Joint Commission coming, we haven't, I think, made a decision yet. So that's a good, it's a, it's a good question. I, you're, you're referring to the wake up uh, trial, which was also published in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, I think in 2018. Um, and uh, basically, uh, the the upshot uh, of that was that uh, in patients who are not um, candidates for mechanical thrombectomy, but who otherwise meet criterion for IV uh, TPA, uh, but we don't know when their symptoms started. So it doesn't have to be a wake up stroke. Of course, it could be anyone who we don't know when their symptoms started. But we do know that off of you know strokes uh, most commonly occur early uh, in the morning or sometimes during sleep. And if we don't know, you know, if the patient went to bed at 11 and they wake up at seven and they're hemiplegic and we don't know when the stroke started, we uh, can use uh, MRI uh, to help us uh, with regard to a, a mismatch. You hear me? Sorry. You hear me? Absolutely. Sorry, I'm just muted. Sorry. So, and a mismatch means that on the diffusion MRI, you see uh, an area of infarcted brain and on the flare uh, images, you see none. And if they have that mismatch based on the results of the wake up trial, it is reasonable to treat those patients with intravenous uh, thrombolytics. We have not been doing that at St. Catharines. I am not sure if you guys have there. Uh, I yes, think... Yes. Was that? We haven't yet. Yeah, we're so. Debating on whether we should do it or not, but you know. Yeah, I, 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 just, my, my, my personal opinion is, is that, you know, these are patients who we, we wouldn't otherwise have a heck of a lot to offer. And I think that um, if the deficits are uh, significant enough, um, uh, and, and in particular in patients maybe, you know, who don't have uh, uh, massive uh, infarcts where the risk of bleeding is, is less likely, I think that if, if that's the only chance they have to have a better outcome, which is what the wake up trial showed, I think it's something we should be, <clears throat> excuse me, integrating into our uh, clinical practice. Everybody has MRI scanners. <clears throat> Everybody can do, these are plain non-contrast MRIs. You know, and uh, routine sequences are flare and diffusion, uh, you know, on any person who you order this on, even if you don't think they had a stroke. So, you know, these are things that can be done relatively uh, uh, quickly. Uh, of course, you know, an MRI does take more time and requires a little more manpower than does a non-contrast CAT scan. But I think that, you know, this is something we should seriously be uh, uh, considering and something that uh, I, I think is is completely reasonable. Um, I'm not sure that there's other great data besides the wake-up trial. Well, but, I was about to say, you know, this, that's a, a single, to me, the shocking part was that we had, we had guidelines 
before, uh, like maybe less than a year before those guidelines. And those were, they updated those guidelines and added this monkey wrench uh, for yeah. it. And the, the point is, it's a single study. I mean, I, I'm all for it. It's just the problem is, is we don't have you know much to offer these patients if 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 we if we don't do that. And given the frequency of acute ischemic stroke, you know, early in the morning, you know, the patient may be. Uh, you know, at three, four in the morning, if you're like me, you wake up, you fall asleep, you wake up, you fall asleep. You know, you, you don't know exactly when the deficit started. And yeah. so, um, but, you know, without having a better treatment, yeah, even though it's only one trial, and I'm sure that it will be proven, uh, uh, or I don't know about proven, but I'm sure it'll be looked at again, uh, or is being looked at again. Uh, it's still, I think, uh, it, it, you know, the patient, uh, you know, based on that trial, I think if there's family, especially, and this can be quickly discussed and, you know, what's, what's happening, it should be done with informed consent if you're going yeah. to do it. Yeah. And uh, I think it's, it's a, a reasonable option, uh, you know, and I think it's going to be something that uh, is more commonly seen over the next, you know, several years. Um, yeah, I'm hoping that, uh, I mean, I, I agree 100% that it's, it's another opportunity to offer care, so we should very strongly embrace it. And I actually see a comment from my good friend, AJ Berdia, from uh, up in uh, St. Paul's Mather, who's saying that he's working on that also. He proposed it to the radiologists uh, for interpretation, because that's the other thing. You know, you want a radiologist interpretation of an MRI, uh, of and uh, he's, he's waiting on an answer. So I think all of us are, are working on this in one way or another, and I think yeah. Karen uh, just made a comment, uh, our stroke coordinator, that another obstacle is the teleneurologist because we're using the teleneurologist now. And so they are also considering it. And I think we brought it up to them and they are taking care of our hospitals, but other hospitals too, and they're, they haven't seen it anywhere applied yet in the U.S. And so I think all of us want to do it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, you're right. There, there, is, there, there does seem to have been a sort of a, a stall um, in, in, in going forward uh, with this. But I think that, uh, again, my feeling is that if somebody is going to be left with a significant deficit and has a low likelihood of bleeding, meaning that they have a relatively uh, low score um, on their NIHSS and they have an aspect score of 10, uh, my feeling is, you know, if it's me, give it to me. You know, that's, and, you know, that's, actually, that's my yeah. feeling. Uh, Mark is asking a question. Um, he's saying, are there any reasons it's not given to patients that are wake-up strokes currently pretty much tagging along to what you're saying? And are there any negative outcomes associated to giving, giving it to patients outside the time window? So what, why well, don't the, the risk of bleeding increases, of course, if you give it outside the time window, and that's the major risk. I mean, if you give it to a patient who woke up with a stroke and they were, let's say they were hemiplegic, and you gave it and they didn't bleed and they wound up being hemiplegic anyway. I mean, you, you've done no harm and that's the number one uh, uh, thing. So again, I think that it, 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 I think that the best patients for the, you know, certain strokes are small strokes, even though they leave big deficits. And I'm talking in particular about lacunar infarcts that are very strategically located in yeah. deep areas of the brain. So the likelihood of them bleeding with TIA, uh, with TPA is very low. Um, and so, uh, you know, giving it to them seems especially reasonable. And that's a clinical diagnosis. You know, you, you might know that before the patient even goes uh, to the MR scanner. Of course, yeah. you still want to do that, that, you know, your due diligence. But I think that in patients uh, who don't have another option but have a devastating stroke due to certainly due to a small vessel infarct, I, 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 I think it's something we should be uh, initiating and initiating soon. Great. Thank you, Bruce. Thank and, you. Uh, definitely you generated a lot of uh, heat discussion. <laughs> Oh yeah, no, I don't. Uh, any other questions? Uh, but guys, obviously, oh, maybe let's see. Uh, there's another one. Would you give IVTPA to a patient that had a history of thalamic hemorrhage? Um, so, a hit, uh, so, yeah. So, so th this was. I mean, it, it wouldn't have to be a thalamic hemorrhage. I mean, it could be. It, it could be any hemorrhage. And and this uh, was, uh, uh, you know, recently. Um, uh, uh, discussed in the in the updated. Um, guidelines and initial the uh, originally the guidelines said that if a patient has any history of an intracerebral hemorrhage that they uh, you know can't uh, receive IVTPA. I think that 
uh, as far as the updated guidelines go, if a patient uh, has a history of a thalamic hemorrhage, and the implication of that is that it was a hypertensive thalamic hemorrhage, whether it's thalamus, basal ganglia, <clears throat> um, and, they, uh, and they have an acute ischemic stroke of which they are at risk uh, for, obviously, because they have hypertension that manifested as that. Uh, it, as long as it wasn't, you know, recent, those patients uh, at the judgment of the uh, clinician can be given TPA. So the answer is yes, you can uh, uh, do it, but, you know, it, obviously that, that would be another circumstance, of course, in which you want an informed consent and really explain the risks uh, versus uh, uh, the benefits. So. Great. Thank you, Bruce. All righty. So we seem to be back on track in terms of time. That's fantastic. So, um, before I introduce our next speaker, I want to um, I'm going to send everybody, all the participants, a poll. Uh, I want to see what um, uh, what breakout seminar you want to participate around lunchtime. Uh, so there's going to be three options. One of them is going to be it, through this stream. Uh, there's going to be two others that I'm going to send you separate links for, and then once the lunch uh, seminar is over, we will um, uh, we will. Uh, uh, bring you back into, you will have to log back into the main uh, feed for the second part of the conference. So a little bit tedious there, but uh, I hope uh, everybody doesn't get uh, too confused with all the links that are going to be coming your way. Um, so I'm going to uh, float this poll um, to you guys and uh, feel free to answer it so that we have an understanding of who goes where. Now, uh, the next speaker, um, it's actually... Uh, a distinct pleasure to introduce her. Her name is Elizabeth Hogan. She is uh, our nurse practitioner uh, here at the endovascular suite and uh, my counterpart in organizing this conference. So a lot of you might be in communication with her uh, or um, uh, uh, see her in the emails. She has been uh, 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 toured de force in getting this conference off the ground. Uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, my distinct pleasure to have her present this morning. She will be uh, uh, talking, uh, uh, Bruce spoke a lot about the new developments in the uh, medical treatment of stroke. She'll be talking about the new developments in the endovascular treatment of stroke, which is something we do uh, downstairs in the angio suite. And uh, without further ado, I'm gonna give you Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth, do you wanna share your screen maybe? Can you hear her? Hi, everyone. Just waiting for presentation to load up here. I can see it. You can see? Mm -hmm. I cannot. <laughs> can you guys see me? Oh, here we go. Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Elizabeth. I know uh, Dr. Becklish just gave me a very nice introduction. Thanks. For that, uh, I do have a counterpart as well. Uh, Amanda couldn't here? actually be here to present with me, but she did help me uh, make this presentation. So we'll move forward and talk about uh, new developments in the endovascular world of treating stroke, um, whereas uh, we just talked a lot about the medical treatment of stroke. So objectives for the presentation, uh, we'll just go over some of the newer studies. Uh, there are several that have been done in the last five or six years or so. Um, we're moving forward now, and Dr. Beckless talked a lot about the future of stroke care. And so we're going to discuss how these newer trials in the last three years or so are changing the trajectory of stroke care and really extending the amount of time uh, that we have to intervene for some of these people that are presenting with stroke-like symptoms. Uh, after that, we'll move on to talking about the real future of stroke care here. And Good Sam has been at the forefront of this. Really exciting okay. things coming I can, uh... with artificial intelligence in stroke care. So we're going to talk a lot about mechanical thrombectomy for stroke. Um, really, it's the essence of what we do down in the uh, endovascular suite. 
Uh, the big question and what we're going to talk about today is how long do we have to intervene for strokes? So several years back and in earlier studies, we're with medical intervention, we're talking about three hours and in some uh, specific cases, we can push it out to four and a half hours, which is great, but not that long when you're considering things like when we talk about wake up strokes or people who have an unknown time of onset. There's a lot of people say they live alone or, you know, some a family member calls or comes over to check on somebody and they're found down per se. We don't know when these symptoms started. So we're talking about uh, being able to intervene for these people further out. Uh, and we're going to talk about really the um, mechanics of doing so. So there's some pictures here that just give you a, a real kind of simplified version of what goes on in the suite. So a stent uh, or a stent retriever, what we'll talk a lot about today is this uh, fishnet looking thing there that kind of captures the blood clot and then uh, we can pull it out uh, with the use of suction uh, or devices that Dr. Beckless can uh, send up to the brain via catheters. Um, on the right, that's what that's showing you there. You have uh, the use of suction or uh, mechanical thrombectomy, which means breaking up the blood clot and pulling it out in that fishnet-like stent. So this talks about all the trials. Uh, we're not really going to touch on the older ones, NINDS and ECAS-3. Uh, everyone's probably familiar with those at this point. These are the trials talking about medical intervention, zero to three or three to four and a half hours. Um, then came up a handful of studies. Um, Mr. Clean might be the one that everyone's most familiar with there when we're talking about zero to six hours. So now we've extended our time a little bit where we can intervene from a mechanical thrombectomy perspective. Um, mostly what we're gonna talk more about today are these newer trials, the Dawn and the Diffuse 3 trials, where we're extending our time period for intervention out to 16 to 24 hours. Um, this really, widens the uh, group of stroke patients that we can help uh, based on the um, timing here that these studies are letting us intervene. So the DAWN trial, six to 24 hours uh, after stroke-like symptoms. And we're talking about relative to imaging here as well. This is what's different about these studies as opposed to some of the earlier ones that were done for mechanical thrombectomy. Uh, in the DAWN and the Diffuse 3 trials, we're specifically talking about thrombectomy for stroke patients based on some findings on imaging and with the DAWN trial, also how the patient clinically presents and how that might actually not match what you're seeing in terms of core infarct on your imaging studies. So the DAWN trial, uh, patients to be included in the study had to have a proximal ICA or MCA, so anterior circulation stroke, who presented within 24 hours uh, of last known well time. Also, the clinical de deficit of the patient, so NIH scores, uh, how the patient appears, uh, doesn't necessarily match the infarct volume or the core infarct that you're seeing on imaging. So these are patients with more severe strokes and maybe one that doesn't look quite so large on imaging. Patients had to be 18 years or older. Modified Rankin scores, we talked a little bit about uh, in the last presentation, and we're going to talk about it some more here. Uh, it's really a disability scale that we talk about patients that have you know, functional independence post-stroke. Uh, they cannot have any evidence of ICH, uh, and the infarct size, that's core infarct that we're talking about, must be less than one-third of the MCA territory in order for these patients to be part of the trial. In the DAWN trial, treatment was only performed with the use of the Trevo device. This is a uh, stent retriever, it's called. That's a picture of the device there. Um, it's really, like we talked about, like a fishnet type uh, device that goes up in a catheter. It uh, is uh, released and then left in place for a couple of minutes uh, and then pulled out and hopefully with some clot and we can restore blood flow beyond that area of uh, thrombosis. Uh, outcomes from the DAWN trial. So we talked a little bit about the modified Rankin score. There is a picture of it on the right that you can kind of see what we're looking at here. When we talk about um, the functional independence of patients at 90 days post thrombectomy plus standard care or standard care alone, we're talking about a score of two or better. So patients with a zero, one or two 90 days out uh, when we talk about thrombectomy plus standard care versus standard care alone, we're talking about TPA. So these patients are not, uh, you know, being included in these trials for thrombectomy and then not allowed to receive TPA. You know, they might be plus or minus TPA. So we're not excluding those people. Um, 
There were similar rates, this is very interesting, of functional independence from the DAWN trial uh, for these patients that were intervened on six to 24 hours post symptoms. This is similar to patients in prior studies that were from zero to six hours. So that's something that's positive, you know, going forward, we know we can intervene in these people and get as good or better outcomes at six to 24 hours out. Moving on to the DIFFUSE-3 trial, uh, patients to be included in the study, also proximal and anterior circulation occlusion on imaging. Uh, they also could have thrombectomy plus TPA or uh, standard me medical therapy alone. Thrombectomy was performed in these patients within six to 16 hours of symptom onset and evidence of penumbra. When we talk about penumbra, we're talking about brain tissue around that core infarct that is still salvageable, meaning there's still blood flow getting there and we might be able to save that brain. Um, estimates of the volume of the core infarct and salvageable brain were actually calculated using an uh, artificial intelligence software called RAPID. So we mentioned that before, we're gonna talk a lot more about that later. Uh, both the DAWN and the Diffuse 3 trials use this RAPID software uh, to decide which patients were el eligible based on um, infarct core, stroke core, stroke size, uh, stroke burden, and that percentage in difference of uh, the salvageable brain that you have. So is inclusion criteria in the Diffuse 3 trial is actually a little bit wider. Our target population is bigger than it was with the DAWN trial. The reason for that is because there was no limitation of the NIH score. So we're including patients with, uh, you could say, more mild strokes, lower NIH scores, and also severe strokes. And it's also um, that difference in core infarct versus uh, salvageable brain tissue. Treatment in the Diffuse 3 trial patients could be any FDA approved device uh, as opposed to the DAWN trial where this is a Trevo stent retriever only. And outcomes again uh, showed that thrombectomy patients had better functional independence on the modified wrinkle scale at 90 days. So this is a great slide to kind of put it all together and show that uh, even when we're intervening six to 12 and 12 to 24 hours out, the patients are still having better outcomes. Uh, basically what it's saying here is that with uh, intervention with the Trevo stent retriever, 55% of patients are having modified ranking scores of two or less and better functional independence uh, compared to medical therapy alone where we're only 20%. And same thing on the other side here, 12 to 24 hours, we're still at 43%. Now, when you look back to trials like the Mr. Clean trial uh, a couple of years back where we were doing mechanical thrombectomy, not specifically picking patients based on imaging, um, we we're more in like the 30% range. So numbers are, are better here. And this is a good slide to show all the differences of the studies. Uh, another nice slide for kind of putting things in perspective of how effective this treatment really is. Um, what you're looking at here is on the left, we're talking about the Trevor stent retriever with the DAWN trial. And on the right, we're comparing to uh, cardiovascular interventions, um, maybe in the, in the cardiac world. So everyone kind of knows the signs and symptoms of heart attack. Everybody knows if you think somebody's having a heart attack in the field, you want to, one of the first things you think of is giving aspirin, right? So this slide is saying for every 42 people that you give aspirin to, you're going to have uh, one person with, with positive outcome. Now on the left, you can see how different these numbers are. So for every two people that you use the, the Trevo stent retriever in the DAWN trial, you're going to have uh, improved functional independence. Looking at the studies side by side, uh, they seem similar, but they have some differences. Whereas the DAWN trial, we're looking at a difference in the uh, clinical picture of the patient or your NIH scores. Uh, remember, we're only intervening in patients who have higher NIH scores, so more severe strokes, and a mismatch of what the patient clinically looks like versus what you're seeing on imaging. Um, whereas the Diffuse 3 trial, we're intervening only 6 to 16 hours after, but the size of the stroke, we're intervening with more, with larger strokes and also smaller, maybe with patients milder symptoms. This, again, really widens your target population. Um, so we were able to include more people in the, in the trials. Now I do have some images here. We're gonna talk a little bit some more. We'll go through some uh, 
patient cases in a little bit, but this is your mean transit time and your blood volume next to each other. So on the left is your blood volume, on the, on the right is your mean transit time. So when you're looking at CT perfusion studies, what we're looking for is mismatch. And basically, uh, to simplify it, you're looking for, uh, does one picture look like it matches the other? Now, when you have an area of this dark blue on the right, I can show you with my mouse here, um, and you don't see kind of a matching change on the other side where it's a difference in color. So that would be somebody who we might consider taking for a mechanical thrombectomy. This one might be a little bit easier to see. Um, again, the Dawn and the Diffuse 3 trials both utilize the same uh, artificial intelligence software um, to kind of um, limit the human uh, factor that comes in with saying, hey, you know, this stroke looks like it's one third less uh, of the MCA territory. And I think that they, you know, could go for intervention. The software will do that for us. Um, and again, on the right, you just have some examples of your MTT or your mean transit time versus your blood volume pictures. And you can see that there's a mismatch here. You know, it doesn't look the same. Here's your large area of uh, penumbra here and on this side you see that the blood is still getting to that area because there's no uh, decreased blood volume in that spot. So as promised we're going to talk a little bit more about some artificial intelligence and how uh, this really is the future of stroke care. So it's exciting. It's something that's going to be up and coming at Good Samaritan. We're really working on uh, starting to utilize this in our practice. Um, and you know there's a couple of reasons why it's awesome and it's going to be really uh, good for patients. You know, everything's about patient care and with stroke specifically, uh, improving our times uh, to response and, and really tr getting to that patient and triaging them quickly to intervene as quickly as we can in the right way. So with artificial intelligence uh, helping to detect those LVOs and at the same time, what's really a great thing about the uh, software itself is that we can have the whole team uh, alerted basically about a, a potential stroke as it's happening. So everyone's going to be updated in real time, which helps for, you know, getting the team together to intervene as quickly as possible. So pre precision of diagnosis, because the software is going to calculate um, core infarct versus salvageable brain tissue and give us or Dr. Beckless or whoever may be the radiologist, the interventionalist, whoever is interpreting those images, they're gonna you know, be able to look at percentages and numbers right there of how much stroke burden there is and whether the patient's a candidate for thrombectomy based on LVO or not. This is gonna really talk to quality improvement because it's gonna improve our patient outcomes and hopefully improve our efficiency as a team. Um, Artificial, the uh, rapid AI incorporates clinical data and it will allow for a more personalized approach to uh, each, each patient case. So we're talking a lot about imaging here. I will show you some more um, examples with some patient cases from our practice, but imaging really is the key. Uh, we're making decisions based on, uh, you know, what imaging looks like, what the patient looks like clinically, and using the data from these studies. You know, at Good Samaritan, since the start of this program, we've been practicing this way since then, and that's really even before the studies have really been widely uh, published. So, we, you know, onward and upward, we are definitely moving forward and staying at the forefront of stroke care here, which is really exciting. Rapid AI. Again, um, you can use CT, CTA, CT perfusion, which is what we tend to use at Quitsam. You just heard in the last uh, talk that we are talking about maybe um, adding some other ways that we can intervene for different types of strokes using MRIs, things like that. But right now it is really the CTA and the CT perfusion that helps us decide if we're gonna take a patient for a stroke intervention or not, um, and whether they're a candidate or not to do so. Again, all of this bottom line is to help triage and uh, treat patients more efficiently and improve patient outcomes. Rapid AI is going to help us to do all these things and do it quickly. Um, it's, this software detects suspected LVO, 97% sensitivity and 96% specificity. So it's going to be really helpful to our team. So 
Case number one, um, a patient from our practice, past medical history significant for chronic right ICA occlusion and hyperlipidemia presented to the hospital status post fall. So this is an interesting case because he was actually an inpatient stroke. Uh, he was in an ICU setting and was monitored for a small traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage, which he did not have a significant deficit from. But on hospital day number four, he was found with uh, significantly increased altered mental status and uh, new right side weakness. His CTA showed that he had a, a left MCA occlusion and he did have ischemic penumbra or area around um, the core infarct there that looked like he had salvageable tissue. So we took him for mechanical thrombectomy and he was TK0 to TK3. Uh, walked out of the hospital on post update nine. So here's some uh, examples of his imaging. Again, you can see your mismatch here. Uh, you have an area of brain tissue that's having what we call prolonged uh, mean transit time. So uh, you can think of it like a roadblock or a traffic jam. So if you have a, say the LIE has an accident and now uh, it's closed at exit 62. So everyone needs to get off. Can everyone get off and go a different way and still get to exactly where they wanna be? So now you're gonna look at your blood volume picture. And if there are other routes, or we call it collateral circulation, the uh, patient may have an area of ischemic penumbra or salvageable brain tissue. And if so, that's what makes them a good candidate for mechanical thrombectomy. Uh, over here, you can see these are actually uh, intra-op pictures. Um, this is a left common carotid artery. And you can see up here, this is the left MCA uh, occlusion. And on the right here is post-trevo. Uh, you can see the re restoration of flow in TK3 revascularization. Another patient case, a 60-year-old lady. Um, this case is good because this is when we're talking about our unknown time of onset. She had a history of AFib, but we weren't really sure whether she was on anticoagulation, which right there makes her not a candidate for uh, TPA unless we can get that clarified. If somebody comes in um, altered and without family, you know, in COVID times, we have that problem frequently. There's not as much family at the bedsides and we have to try to be contacting them uh, of course, all at the same time while the patient's going to the scanner and things like that so that we can treat them as quickly as possible. Uh, in this woman's case, she ended up being found with a left M1 occlusion and also had perfusion mismatch on her uh, CTA and CTP. We did a mechanical thrombectomy and she was also a TK0 to TK3 revascularization. If you look at her imaging here now, this is a good one to look at because you can see your uh, prolonged mean transit time here. And on the left side in your blood volume, you can see that this area here looks a little bit different. So she actually does have a core infarct here already. Um, now we're talking about percentage again of, is this a third of the MCA region? Is it two thirds? Is it, you know, is it more than 50% of the stroke completed? Uh, meaning uh, core infarct is already there. So dead brain tissue. Um, these are things that the radiologists, the interventionalists um, who are reading the studies are making these judgments and then we're taking the patients and treating them based on that. This rapid uh, artificial intelligence software is going to help kind of um, bring this all together and lessen the uh, human guessing work, if you will, that goes into a uh, percentage of uh, salvageable brain tissue and whether we bring the patient for a thrombectomy. She was a candidate. We took her. These are her intra-op imaging. Uh, happens to also be a left MCA occlusion. So you can see it here where you have no flow here. There's, there's nothing going on. And if you look over here, post-trevo, um, you have TK3 revascularization. You can see all the vessels post that occlusion, which is cool to see. So We moved kind of quickly through that one. Thank you guys. Uh, it's good to be here. Um, I'm happy to be a part of this uh, team. We really are doing some exciting things here at Good Sam and at all of the uh, sister hospitals here in CHS. Um, any questions and comments? I will have Dr. Beckless uh, scoot in and, and help as well. And I'll stop sharing my screen here. All right, great. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so uh, really exciting stuff, uh, especially on the artificial intelligence front.
And, um, you know, I, I see uh, on the panelists, uh, I see a few folks that are in other hospitals and obviously uh, Bruce and I are moderating this session, but I want to get everybody's if, if you guys can hear us and I can unmute you. Um, so, you know, rapid AI is a way for us to obviously see uh, very quickly, have a determination of eligibility for mechanical thrombectomy uh, and also identify large vessel occlusion. So, you know, you kind of take away even the radiologist in, in this whole process or the need for interpretation. Um, it's a program or software that we're piloting at Good Sam, and the goal is to spread it in other institutions, St. Joe's, St. Katz, and um, I guess the sky's the limit when, uh, where, where it would go. But I guess I'll start with Bruce and see what his take is. You know, would that be useful for St. Catharines, for example, to have as a, as a software to allow, uh, you know, you would have an answer right away uh, and that would allow you to communicate with a neurointerventionalist on call if need be uh, without the need for, you know, right now there's a lot of layers. You know, you, you call us, we have to log in somewhere, take a look at an image. Right now it would be all seamless through uh, the same process happening uh, right away. Um, so, Bruce, what do you think? I think, um, I, you know, the, the technology is, is, is headed that way. Um, I guess my only uh, concern um, would be that, uh, you know, the, like uh, when, when we're treating these patients, you know, mistakes can't be made. And the, the human uh, um, uh, intervention, uh, to, to me, is something that may be hard to replicate uh, uh, with technology, um, uh, you know, alone. I, I, I think that at the end of the day, it comes down to much of the time a judgment call. And I'm not sure that there's ever, you know, a um, perfectly a black and white answer based on many different uh, uh, scenarios that, that can occur. And, you know, with, with this type of intelligence, I think that, you know, that, that's, that's what you might risk. Um, I agree with you. And, you know, I think, I think that's the benefit of this is that it, it definitely, you know, kind of maybe identifies the large vessel occlusion. But regardless, if you have high clinical suspicion, you can ask the interventionalist to review the films. The, po the positive aspect of this is that it's a, a device agnostic app that will show up on your smartphone or your smartwatch. So, you know, your, your interventionalist is driving somewhere. They can look at the films and then you can get an answer immediately. Even if say, say you think you say, well, this patient behaves as a large vessel occlusion. The machine says it's not. Um, can you yeah, take I mean, look, they can do that seamlessly versus, you know, the old way of finding a computer, logging in and, and delaying things in the process. So I think that's the benefit. I, I, I don't think that we can exclude the interpretation factor uh, but we can make things a lot more compact in terms of the in-between times. Yeah, I, listen, anything that, that, that reduces, uh, you know, door to needle or, or door to groin puncture time, uh, I'm, I'm for in general, um, you know, and I, I suspect that as time goes on, the technology uh, will become more and more sophisticated. Uh, such that you know it, it it you know it may have a a significantly larger role in the management um, of these patients. So I think we'll have to s see how it plays out. Uh, you know, and then of course it's a question of you know having it for our um, hub hospital uh, versus our spoke hospitals and mm -hmm. and, and and how that well, will play out. Also, you know. Yeah. I would, you know, because the machine is great. I mean, it doesn't have, so there's options where you don't have to have the perfusion function. Say if we want to do the perfusions at the point of care, you don't have to have the perfusion, but you can have the CTA interpretation function and that can yeah. allow you to look at the films uh, remotely, so to speak, without having uh, the challenges that, that come from that. Um, and I know that Dr. Matthew is a big proponent of this. I don't know if he is with us right now, but if he, if John, if you're, if you're here, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, tell us what you think about this or whether you, how you feel about it at St. Joe's. I see, uh, I see comments from uh, AJ up in uh, St. Charles. Um, the, he's asking whether we have any of the new AI pictures. Actually, the, 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 the protocol has not been implemented yet. We're working on getting it. That's why you saw all the old perfusion pictures. Uh, it should be up and running in about a month or so. Uh, in perfect timing for us or 
I guess I'm saying that uh, sarcastically for our survey, because, uh, you know, new things when the Joint Commission comes, they're always a problem. But uh, uh, yeah, so, so it requires a bit of integration with IT. And so IT is working with Rapid to get this up and running. Uh, but it should be up in about a month or so. And on the perfusion side, AJ, what you're asking, you don't have to have perfusion necessarily. Uh, uh, if, so if, if, say, for example, St. Charles wanted to participate in this program, uh, you could have just a CTA protocol that would tell you if there's a large vessel occlusion. And so you can immediately engage an interventionalist, either us or, you know, most of the times uh, up there, you know, it might be more uh, uh, appropriate to send the patient to Stony Brook if there's an mechanical thrombectomy need for aneurysms, obviously we're happy to see these patients, but uh, for something that's time sensitive, uh, it probably needs to be in the closest uh, comprehensive stroke center. Uh, now, when, um, uh, when it comes to uh, the perfusion, you, potentially you can, if you wanted to have it, the software allows that uh, as an option. Uh, and, and in that case, you have an answer about whether the patient is really candidate or not, and uh, you know you can make that decision there at the point of care. It doesn't really matter if your treatment center is close, but uh, that's kind of uh, where we are. Uh, uh, I see that uh, Dr. Matthew uh, is unmuted. Uh, Jeff, yeah. Hey, hey Kimon, how are you? Good. Yeah, I, I I did want to comment that you know I'm I'm a big proponent for uh, for the artificial intelligence, and as we talk, and you know I'll discuss it a little bit later on, just on the the need for having a, a comprehensive uh, a way of managing stroke-related care throughout a system, I think there's no better way than having rapid access to information. Um, and, you know, and, you know, some of the trials that uh, uh, were being discussed even before were using rapid, right? So there's rapid mm -hmm. and then there's this AI. Um, but both softwares really uh, share information a quick evaluation of these patients. And again, like you were mentioning, for, for a primary stroke center, such as St. Joe's, let's say Catherine's Charles, we may not need the perfusion and we can discuss that later, which I would love to still have because in, in terms of having perfusion, we may be able to save that patient a trip to Good Samaritan Hospital or somewhere else if they don't have a, a match there, right? If they don't have penumbra uh, or salvageable brain tissue. But here, at least we can discuss just, uh, you know, finding those patients that have large vessel occlusion very quickly and getting that information disseminated to the appropriate people in the right amount of time. Um, it, I, I think it's, uh, it's the next step. I'm glad you guys are doing that. And uh, I'll be working with you to try to move that software to uh, some of our primary stroke centers. That's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I see uh, Dr. Ryan from St. Catharines there. If, uh, if Jim, if you want to make a comment, if you're, if you're there or Rob from Mercy. Uh, either of you guys, uh, if uh, just before the break, uh, it's a good opportunity to see if we can uh, uh, get some interest in this technology. Uh, let's see. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> um, so, um, all righty. So we, we'll talk with everybody, uh, both with Jim and Rob later on anyway, uh, about this. Uh, and uh, uh, I think, so now we've kind of uh, spoken extensively about how we treat stroke um, in the acute phase. Uh, stroke presents medically, interventionally, how do we address it? The second part of the morning session will be more on the prevention of stroke, primary prevention, secondary prevention, when it comes to medical interventions to prevent a stroke and also surgical interventions to prevent a stroke and also um, surgical interventions to prevent the secondary impacts of stroke when Dr. Mises is gonna talk about a decompressive hemicraniectomy. Uh, so uh, stay tuned. We're going to go on a very short break until 10 o'clock, and uh, we will um, uh, we will uh, engage um, immediately after. Uh, if uh, you have any questions, uh, you can shoot them during the break, and we'll answer them immediately after. Otherwise, I'll see you all at uh, 10 o'clock. Thank you.
All right, guys, uh, it's 10 o'clock. Uh, time to start our uh, second morning uh, session. Um, as I said, we, uh, we spoke for, uh, we spoke initially about uh, treatment of acute ischemic stroke. The second uh, morning session still focuses on ischemic stroke, and we will be, hey, Bruce, we will be talking uh, more about uh, the uh, secondary prevention or primary prevention of ischemic stroke, but also the prevention of the secondary sequela of ischemic stroke. And uh, to kick off this, uh, the second session uh, will be my partner. It's uh, Dr. Misios. It's my unique pleasure to uh, introduce him to you guys. Uh, he is a neurointerventionalist and a neurosurgeon. Uh, so he is very familiar uh, with all things stroke. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he will be talking a little bit about uh, how we can prevent the secondary consequences of stroke. And I, th I think uh, Bruce uh, mentioned uh, earlier slightly uh, about the option of uh, hemicraniectomy when it comes to stroke. Uh, and uh, uh, Simeon will give you the evidence behind it and when we do it, why we do it, and what we can gain uh, uh, by performing um, uh, that procedure. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a special treat to have him present. So, uh, uh, he was going to present last year also, but unfortunately, he was in the operating room. So uh, I'm going to have him share his screen and Simeon take it home. All right, let me see. Good. Can everyone see this and hear me okay? Absolutely. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you again for the invitation to uh, present. It's a great honor. Um, and a great pleasure to uh, be able to uh, be part of this uh, conference uh, uh, two years in a row now. Uh, and uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about what happens uh, if the patients don't show up uh, within the window for revascularization, or if the patients unfortunately end up completing the stroke uh, despite successful revascularization. And this is uh, the, the procedure of a decompressive hemicraniectomy. It's an old procedure. Uh, and but what is the data that it works? What is what is the benefit? What is the prognosis of these patients? What can we expect? Um, of no disclosures. So um, as I'm sure, 
has been repeated in, in, in all the presentations today. A stroke is a serious health issue. It's the second most common cause of death globally adults. Uh, there have been tremendous advancements within the recent years uh, for the use of intravenous thrombolysis and endovascular mechanical thrombectomy. But again, despite all these techniques, unfortunately, patients still end up presenting to the emergency room with completed infarcts, so they're not candidates for revascularization. Or even despite successful revascularization, a large area of the brain has completed the infarct. Uh, and an infarcted area will create inflammation in the brain, which will cause increased ICP, and if there is no other treatment, it can lead to cerebral herniation. So decompressive hemocraniectomy is a surgical procedure that allows the creation of more room, essentially, for the brain to swell into. Um, during this procedure, a portion of the skull is removed. Uh, the, uh, it is a surgical procedure that takes about an hour, an hour and a half. So it's not a very long procedure by neurosurgical standards, but it does involve a very wide incision, as you can see here, where the scalp is re reflected anteriorly. A number of burkles are created and a large area of the bone is removed and the scalp is then sutured back in place. It sounds very strange, it sounds very weird when we explain it to families, it's always sort of sounds like an alien concept, um, but, uh, but it's a procedure that we unfortunately have to do fairly frequently. Uh, now again, the patient without a skull, you know, if, if they survive, they stay without a skull for about two months, and then there's another surgical procedure where we can re-implant the resected uh, skull flap in place. Uh, they are developing an area of uh, malignant cerebral edema in the territory of the right MCA, secondary to the right MCA ischemic stroke. You can see the same patient a few days later, the stroke has evolved, there's much more edema, the ventricles are shifted to the left quite significantly. And this is a patient where if nothing is done, they're gonna to proceed to cerebral herniation, coma, and death. Uh, and this is uh, the, the picture of the patient after the hemicraniectomy has been performed. So you see the area of the skull missing here. Uh, the brain has enough room to swell out. The uh, degree of midline shift has improved. And you can see some evolving blood products um, on the surface of the brain, which are to be expected. Uh, with uh, CT, uh, nowadays we can do more complex uh, 3D reconstructions. And again, this is just to give you an idea of the extent of bony removal that is being done. This, this is a very invasive procedure. The goal is to create as much room as possible for the brain to swell into. So we, we, we don't wanna be stingy here when we do our uh, bony removal. So again, it's, it's a very large area of the bone that is removed. And here you can see it on the scout uh, film um, on CT, again, the degree of bony removal. And this is a patient that is months after the bony removal. So once all the brain or swelling has resolved, there is a lot of encephalomalacia, the brain shrinks to that side. So a lot of times, you know, patients present with this very strange uh, head shape, and this is a patient that would be very appropriate for re-implantation of the uh, bony flap. So who is a candidate for a decompressive craniectomy? So there's two main groups of stroke patients. So patients with large infarction of uh, the MCA territory. Uh, and these are patients who have an infarction supratentorially, uh, and patients with large cerebellar infarction. So the cerebellum is in an area of the skull that we call the posterior fossa. It's a small area to begin with, and when the cerebellum swells, there's even less room for it. Because the brain stem, so any swelling there can... Um, the, the there is uh, when when we do a craniectomy in the area of the cerebellum, we call it the suboccipital craniectomy. And again, most of the data and the information that we're going to discuss today 
involves a supratentorial craniectomy. So a craniectomy in the distribution of the uh, MCA territory. About, uh, you know, an estimate of 10 to 20% of patients with uh, a complete MCA occlusion will proceed to develop malignant uh, edema. Uh, and again, this is when the, what malignant edema means is that there is a large area of ischemic brain tissue, uh, which causes significant increase in ICP and potential herniation. Some predictors of who will develop malignant MCA infarction, uh, obviously the higher the initial uh, NIH score is, the more likely the patient will develop that. History of hypertension, uh, female patients, CHF, and a younger age. So a younger patient has more what we call full, has a fuller brain, meaning that uh, has less atrophy. And as a result, there is less potential space within the skull for the brain to swell into, as opposed to a patient who's in their 90s, for example. Uh, so the younger the age of the patient, the higher the likelihood that they will run into uh, uh, this malignant edema and uh, shift and, and potential herniation. Uh, when treated conservatively, that means that when we try to control the ICP by lowering the CO2 or giving hyperosmolar agents like 3% or higher concentrations of saline uh, or mannitol, um, we're only about 20% successful in treating this. So there's an 80% mortality rate if, if this is treated conservatively. Um, so what is the data that decompressive craniectomy works? And we're gonna talk about the major randomized control trials that, are, that have been published in, in this topic. And before we do that, this is just a very quick reminder of the modified ranking scale, because we're gonna mention this a lot. And that is a standardized scale that assesses how patients recover it's a, it's a scale that assesses the degree of functional recovery uh, after the stroke, after the surgery. Uh, and it's essentially, it's a standardized scale that goes from zero to six. Zero is perfect, no symptoms. Six is death. Uh, three is the main cutoff. So uh, three is moderate disability, but the patient's able to walk without assistance. Anything higher than that uh, means that the patient will require assistance with walking and other bodily functions. So one of the first randomized control trials, you'll see most of these trials are out of Europe. Uh, so this came out of France in 2007, and it is the decimal study. Uh, they looked at patients who were fairly young, 18 to 55, with malignant MCA, infarction. Uh, and they, these patients were randomized to decompressive craniectomy or best medical treatment with the means that we discussed earlier, like essentially hyperosmolar therapy. They were able to accrue only 38 patients over four years. Uh, and they looked at, you know, patients, what was their functional outcome? So favorable functional outcome is again that modified ranking score of zero to three. Again, three is being able to walk uh, on their own without assistance. Um, and they determined that 25% of patients in the, the craniectomy group had favorable functional outcome compared to only 5% in the medical group. And in the surgical group also had a, almost a 53% absolute reduction in mortality. So this study favored the uh, use of decompressive craniectomy. But again, they only looked at young patients. Uh, this, a very similar study, the DESTINY study, was performed in Germany in 2007. And again, they looked at patients that were just five years older than the previous study, 18 to 60, uh, and again, patients were randomized to uh, decompressive craniectomy versus best medical care. Um, and the primary outcome here was not functional ability, but mortality at 30 days. 
Uh, again, with a small number of patients, only 32 patients, uh, but great benefit to survival. 88 patients in the uh, craniectomy group survived compared to 47% of patients in the medical group. Um, when they tried to assess for favorable functional outcome, there was no statistical significance between the two groups. But again, it's, it's a small number of patients that were looked at. Uh, in 2009, the Hamlet trial came out of the Netherlands. Uh, again, a, a very similar setup, uh, 64 patients, so you know, twice the number of patients of the previous studies. Uh, again, what we would call younger patients, 18 to 60, with uh, severe edema that were assigned to craniectomy uh, versus best medical care. They did look at uh, the primary outcome was favorable functional outcome, meaning a modified ranking score less than three. Uh, and then they also did uh, some longer term uh, outcome studies where they looked at the score at three years. Um, again, similarly to the previous study, craniectomy significantly reduced mortality, but there was no statistically significant difference uh, to favorable functional outcomes after one year or three years. One study uh, out of the United States, uh, the head first uh, trial, uh, where they were not, um, so, so they, they did a, a, a two-step approach um, where they looked at thousands of patients were screened, uh, but, but very few patients were actually eligible for the study, and they ended up being randomized to decompressive craniectomy with best medical care or medical care only. They looked at uh, survival at 21 days versus 30 days with the previous trial. Uh, and again, they weren't able to find any statistically significant reduction in mortality, but again, very few patients that were enrolled here so it's very hard to interpret this data. A very interesting study came out in 2014, and that was out of Germany, <clears throat> where the DESTINY trial came uh, out uh, a few years before. And the big question was to analyze the effect of the compressive craniectomy in the older population, because realistically, the majority of patients we see with ischemic infarcts tend to be older, tend to be older than 60. Um, and that's where the question arises, you know, is it, uh, does, does craniectomy help with that, uh, that patient population? So DESTINY2 <clears throat> was a randomized control trial that tried to answer this question, the effect of craniectomy in patients over 60 years old. Uh, this was out of Germany. 13 different German centers, uh, 112 patients, so significantly higher number compared to all the previous studies that we mentioned. They looked at the primary, the primary outcome was a modified ranking score zero to four. So four is, again, you, uh, patient is able to walk, but with assistance uh, at six months. The median age of the patient studied was 70 years old. And the, they did notice that the, in the decompressive craniectomy group, 41% um, of the patients had a modified ranking score of zero to four at six months versus only 16% of patients in the best medical therapy group. Mortality was also improved it was only 43% in the decompressive craniectomy group versus 76 in the best medical treatment group. Um, but again, remember, instead of doing zero to three, they, they, they looked at a score of zero to four. And if we try to sort of analyze that further, there were no patients with MRS of zero to two after the compressive craniectomy. Uh, meaning that every single patient had some degree of deficit and only 7% of patients had an MRS of three. So only 7% of patients after the compressive craniectomy were able to walk independently. 
One other way, because we're dealing with a lot of studies with very few uh, patient, uh, with, with, with small sample groups, small patient populations, another way to look at them is via meta-analysis. There are three large meta-analyses that were published in 2007, 15, and 16, where they pulled together data from the different randomized control trials. Um, Again, this confirmed that the compressed craniectomy improves mortality rates um, and it, in a greater share of patients that survive, they have, but, but they do survive with, with a degree of disability as reflected in the modified ranking uh, score. The timing is a big question and it's, it's a question that uh, as surgeons were um, called to answer very frequently. Uh, none of these trials addressed when you should do a decompressive craniectomy. Uh, and typically the, the times that we're looking at are 12 to 96 hours after the onset of symptoms. Uh, there is no evidence that decompressive craniectomy improves functional outcomes when you do it um, 48 hours after uh, and up to 96 hours after the stroke onset. So, th so if you wait too long, then probably the outcome is not going to be as good. And there's always the dilemma when someone comes in with a complete MCA occlusion and they're young and we know that they're going to swell. The question is, do you wait until the swelling happens? Do you wait until there is shift and potential herniation to do this procedure? or do you intervene early uh, and perform the decompressive craniectomy in anticipation of the swelling? Um, obviously, if you do that, you expose them to the risks of the surgery, but you avoid uh, the risk of secondary tissue damage um, that, that will occur because of the edema. Uh, cerebral edema typically peaks on days two to five after stroke. Uh, and 70% of patients deteriorate clinically due to edema within 48 hours. So there is uh, a large body of literature and, uh, and uh, um, uh, within neurosurgery to, for, that advocates for early decompressive craniectomy. And in closing, there, there is uh, an NIS study. Uh, NIS is a large database uh, of uh, uh, patients who, it's, it's a, a, who get admitted to, to hospitals across the United States. This is a retrospective study, but they looked at uh, 1,300 patients who underwent the compressive craniectomy after a stroke. They compared patients who underwent surgery within 24 hours versus 48 versus 72. Uh, there were no differences in inpatient mortality, uh, but there were higher odds of discharge to rehabilitation when the decompressive craniectomy was delayed. And this, uh, this database does not assess for outpatient mortality, so <clears throat> we don't have that data. <clears throat> um, so in closing, the um, decompressed craniectomy is a life-saving procedure. Uh, but we, we need to be aware that all patients who survive this procedure will have some degree of disability. Uh, with the European randomized control trials, 43% of patients uh, had a modified ranking score of zero to three. Uh, but those were, remember, those were younger patients that were anywhere between 18 and 60 years old. In the DESTINY2 trial, which are the patients over 60, only 7% of patients had a modified ranking score zero to three. Uh, so we're very good at improving survival, um, but not very good at avoiding the severe disability that comes with it. Um, and again, in closing, uh, uh, decompressed craniectomy certainly reduces mortality rates, uh, but again, it comes at a cost of, of uh, some degree of disability which obviously will depend upon the patient's age, upon the extent of completed infarction, uh, and upon the timing uh, of the procedure. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you, Simeon. Uh, if you can uh, hit the stop sharing button. 
Um, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, first of all, this was a, this was a great presentation uh, and uh, you know, really in depth about all the evidence. It's a procedure that we do fairly commonly, but uh, you know, we thank you, thank you for stopping that. Uh, we, uh, we very rarely discuss the evidence and it, it's, what I find interesting is that most of the evidence is from outside the United States, right? Uh, and you know, it, it seems that in the U.S. we just do it. Uh, I think it's tough in our environment to say no to patients. Uh, families want everything done, so we're kind of in a between a rock and a hard place. But um, you, you, you had a very compre a comprehensive slide about timing. What's your take on timing? You know, with the kind of more and more evidence, especially in the New England Journal, like maybe a couple of years ago four or five years ago about doing this early, even before you see signs of deterioration neurologically. Um, you know, if you have a large territory infarction, you don't have any signs of deterioration. Clinically, it's a young person. All of us know they're going to swell. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the, the two arguments are, do you do it uh, and take a risk of surgery, which is minimal, but the morbidity uh, becomes significant, or do you um, wait and uh, wait for the deficit? And what's your personal take on that? Yeah. So that's, that, that, that's an excellent question. The, um, I think that the, it's, it's important to be honest to the family and to engage them early um, and to warn them about all the upcoming possibilities and potential treatments. Uh, a lot of times, if, if there is family available uh, and, and uh, I present to them all the data and let them decide, um, it, my personal take is uh, I'm a huge advocate of early hemicraniectomy. Uh, I think it's a procedure that uh, when we do it in a controlled manner, the risks are minimal. Uh, we avoid all the effects of secondary brain injury that way, so we, so we can help decrease the, the, uh, the added deficits that will come with that. Um, I don't like to wait because once there is significant swelling, we know there's gonna be more brain damage. Once, they, once the patient blows a pupil and undergoes herniation, then it's, uh, we can do this procedure, but we know that further damage has taken place. So just, I don't think it's worthwhile to just sit around and wait for that damage to take place. Uh, so especially if the patient is younger, uh, meaning less than, and you know what young is we can argue, but you no. Know, if the patient is younger than seventy, I always advocate for early hemicraniectomy. Great, that's uh, and I and I think I agree with you one hundred percent on that. Uh, what's your timing on the cranioplasty? You showed those impressive images of kind of the brain being all sucked in, um, and that's the other question. Do you wait <laughs> until you know everything is uh, kind of uh, sucked in and and the swelling has gone away, or do I don't know that we have any good evidence. Maybe I just don't know, but uh, when do you like to do the cranioplasties? And, and that's a big topic of debate among neurosurgeons. And um, the main risk for replacing the bone flap is infection. So we like to make sure that the initial incision has healed uh, 100%. Uh, and we wanna make sure that the swelling has decreased so we can place the bone flap back in place. That whole process takes at least a month. Uh, so typically, most neurosurgeons will wait on an average of about two to three months before the bone flap is replaced. Uh, you, you certainly don't need to wait as long as that picture showed you where you know, the brain is very greatly deformed. But on average, it's two to three months. And, and again, the main issue is so you don't run into an infection because the flap that goes back in place is devascularized. Um, and that means that it is more prone to become infected. And if it becomes infected, patients need another surgery to remove it and get a synthetic flap. So it becomes a bigger issue. I'm muted. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I agree with you. I mean, as, as you said, it's a, I don't know that we definitely know and it's a judgment call every time what we decide to do. Um, there is a question from uh, Dr. Birdie up in St. Charles. She's asking if there's a difference in the outcomes for hemicraniectomies for traumatic uh, etiologies uh, versus ischemic stroke. Um, 
uh, in what we see. Um, and, and I think this is a case by case thing, but I'm gonna let you answer that. Yeah, um, so, you know, they, they both, uh, even though the mechanism is different, uh, the, the, the secondary insult to the brain is very similar. You, you still have edema, you still have the, uh, the influx of uh, white blood cells and all the, the chemical mediators that they secrete that will cause increased brain swelling. Whether it is to dissolve a clot uh, or to dissolve, um, I think the outcomes are very similar. Uh, now, again, these studies that we discussed only focused on stroke. Uh, but again, it's a similar situation uh, when we have, when we deal with a trauma patient. The only difference is that with stroke, I think we can be a little, be, be a little bit more accurate in our prediction of who will swell a lot to require uh, a hemicraniectomy as opposed to a patient with trauma. So, you know, a patient with a contusion, whether the contusion will blossom and how much and how much added volume that will uh, create in the brain, I think we're, we're not as good at, at predicting that. So with, with trauma, a lot of times we wait longer as opposed to doing an early hemicraniectomy. Uh, with stroke, if they have a complete MCA occlusion, we know that they're going to swell a lot. Excellent. I uh, got a couple more questions for you, if you have a second. So um, uh, I have a question. What, what the inc what's the incidence of postcraniotomy seizure disorder? One of our uh, uh, participants is asking. Yeah, it, it's real. Uh, and I can't give you a specific percentage, but all these patients go on prophylactic antiepileptics. Uh, and while on prophylactic antiepileptics, the incidence of seizures is very, very low. Simon, are you there? Sorry, uh, you, you froze a little bit. Uh, you're saying the incidence on Yeah, you, you froze too. Oh, sorry. Uh, so you're saying the incidence is low, and you're referring probably to early seizures, right? Um, Correct. Yeah. And uh, Katrina is asking if cranioplasty decreases the risk of hydrocephalus and changes in CSF dynamics. Well, that's a very complicated question, and uh, I, I don't think we're very good at predicting CSF dynamics uh, with hemicraniectomy. Um, there is a subset of patients who develop hydrocephalus after this procedure. There is a subset of patients who develop uh, very strange cases of hydrocephalus, like external hydrocephalus. Uh, and, and those patients we deal with on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, certainly, uh, we wouldn't hesitate to do a life-saving procedure because of the possibility of developing hydrocephalus down the road. I think it's one of these cases where we do the procedure, we monitor the patient, and if they do develop hydrocephalus, which a subset of patients may develop it, uh, then we deal with it. Kimon, <clears throat> do you, can you yes, hear please. me? Yes, yes, I just yes. Had, I just had a question. Uh, hi, Simeon. I just had a question um, for Simeon. How, how much uh, does the, um, the, the side, the hemisphere, uh, right versus left, come into uh, play when you're making um, decisions about uh, performing uh, decompressive hemicraniectomy uh, versus not? Yeah, ex excellent decision, excellent question. And, and that comes into the discussions with the family because, uh, you know, again, we have to be honest with the family. We, and uh, the main point that, that I stress when I discuss this procedure with families is that we're doing this procedure to save the patient's life, not to improve the, the underlying deficits that they will have because of the infarct. So if it's, uh, obviously if it's a dominant side that is involved, uh, they need to know that the patient will have contralateral weakness, will have speech deficits, uh, and will have a hard time communicating with their environment. Uh, and that, uh, you know, that comes to play if it's a much older patient. Universally, if it's a young patient, you know, under 50 years old, most families will say, 
do everything you can to save their lives. If it's someone in their 80s, um, then a lot of times families may choose to be not as aggressive. Um, but again, yes, that, that, that does play a big role in uh, the discussions with the family. Great, thank you, Simeon. Um, so uh, that's perfect timing. If you guys have any other questions, we can take them offline because now uh, we have to move on to Dr. Mayerson again. Uh, and uh, the second part of his presentation, um, which uh, let me figure this out. Uh, be focusing on the secondary prevention of uh, ischemic stroke. And uh, I'm gonna share my screen, Bruce, so that you can uh, uh, just uh, see the thing. There we go. Great. So Thank you. So the, uh, this is sort of a, a natural follow-up, I guess, to, to the first uh, discussion, which was about um, the acute medical management. Oh no, I'm on low battery. Hold on. Hang on. Sorry. Uh, God. No worries. We don't want to lose the middle of it. All right. Bear with me here. Okay. Can anyone see? Oh, do you see me? Good. So um, the, the first uh, talk was about um, acute uh, medical interventions for uh, ischemic uh, stroke. Um, and this talk is more about the secondary prevention of um, Can you guys hear me? We can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? We can hear you. Hello? 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 I can't see you anymore. I don't know what happened here. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll just talk. I guess I don't yeah, know why I can't. Uh, you can see our screen. Just keep talking, and we'll we'll navigate for you. Be seen. Can you see? Should I try to. Nope. And he's gone. Bruce, are you there? All right. So um, Bruce is having some uh, technical difficulties. Let's give him a couple of seconds. Uh, if he's not back and running, I might I might jump in my presentation. Let's see. All right, I don't see Bruce there. All right, let me switch gears. Bruce, if you're back, just shout out. I will. Do you want to switch with me a little bit? Yeah. Can you grab my phone from the back? All right, so uh, we will, as we're waiting for Bruce to come back to life, <laughs> I will um, I will give my uh, presentation, which was a little later, uh, the same session. So you know, Bruce was talking about secondary prevention of uh, uh, ischemic stroke on the uh, medical side. Uh, I will be talking about. Uh, the surgical side. Bruce, are you back? No, okay. Uh, all righty, so here we go. Let me share my screen. All right. Here we go. So, so you know, uh, we'll, we'll do it a little reverse. You know, obviously the majority of the, sh of the strokes are prevented uh, with medical interventions, uh, but there are some where surgical uh, interventions 
uh, are necessary to, uh, to prevent uh, them from happening. And so one of them is carotid revascularization. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the options for carotid revascularization for uh, stroke prevention. Um, and actually, hold on. Bruce, are you back? Bruce? Yeah, do you hear me? Yeah, do you want to go? I can, I, can, I can put your presentation up so that you're on time. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize. I don't know, I'm not very good at this kind of thing. Hopefully I'll see you all next year in person. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, you're definitely, uh, we're definitely all hoping to be in person next year uh, and not uh, remotely. All right, let me put your presentation up. Sorry, sorry. Oh, no worries. I just, I think it's better if we do it in order. First medical, then surgical. Um, so here we go. Uh, let me share my screen. And here's your presentation. Go ahead. We can hear you and hey. good to go. Okay, next. So again, secondary prevention is what we're talking about. These are in patients who've had a TIA or stroke. Um, and this is just, again, a little bit on the uh, incidence. Um, on average, the annual risk of a future stroke in patients uh, with stroke of TIA is three to four uh, percent. Um, and even though TIAs, by definition, leave a patient uh, unimpaired, uh, their secondary risk is nonetheless significant um, and needs to be treated as aggressively uh, as it would be for um, a completed stroke. So we take TIAs very seriously, even though by the time we see the patient, they may be completely fine um, neurologically. Um, and just some more of, of, of the incidence data, up to 50% of patients with a TIA will have a stroke within five years and if untreated, 18% um, within 90 days. Um, okay, let's, oh, no, go back, sorry. Uh, and in general terms, the things we're going to speak about are uh, um, antiplatelet uh, drugs, uh, risk factor modification, anticoagulation, um, and um, th th uh, intracranial and extracranial stenosis, and hyperlipidemia, of course. Next. So just uh, a brief word on, on some pathophysiology here. Um, are you guys able to see the diffusion? Images on the far right of the screen. Hello? Yes, we can. Okay, great, thanks. So, uh, you know, uh, an important uh, point uh, that needs to be uh, addressed when you're uh, treating patients in terms of secondary stroke prevention is well, what caused the first stroke and what was the underlying uh, pathophysiology? And I showed uh, this, uh, the, this slide in these pictures to demonstrate the difference between you know, the most common types of stroke we see. On the uh, uh, left, you have a large wedge-shaped infarct on diffusion MRI. Uh, it looks like there may be a teeny area of ischemia on the uh, other side as well, adjacent to the lateral ventricle there. Um, and uh, that's typical of an embolic uh, a stroke and is the presumed mechanism when that, when that happens um, with blockage of a large vessel. Those are the LVOs that we talk about, the large vessel occlusions that may, would benefit potentially from mechanical thrombectomy um, versus uh, patients who have traditional risk factors for stroke like hypertension, diabetes, lipids, uh, who develop um, a, a small stroke, a lacunar uh, stroke, of the very small vessels, um, but these are nonetheless uh, significant because the deficits from them, because of the, where they're targeted in very um, uh, 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 high traffic real estate, uh, leading to dramatic deficits is important and needs to be managed. And you can see on the, uh, uh, on the image uh, to the, to the right of the screen, but to the left of the diffusion study is uh, it, the typical chronic ischemic white matter changes that we see in those patients. And if we didn't have diffusion, um, we might not know which one of those was the acute infarct. And that's that was in the old days, not an issue anymore. So let's go to the next one. So when, when discussing uh, primary or secondary uh, pr uh, prevention of stroke, 
general uh, recommendations in terms of vascular risk uh, uh, risk factor uh, management are the same. Uh, the single most important risk factor for at least uh, the small vessel strokes that, that we showed you on the right of the screen earlier uh, is hypertension and medical management of blood pressure is the most uh, important uh, risk factor um, in terms of intervening to prevent uh, strokes. Um, and that's either whether the patient has had a stroke or not, whether it's secondary or primary uh, stroke prevention. Target uh, blood pressure in general, uh, systolic less than 140, diastolic uh, less than uh, 90, and in patients with diabetes and other significant risk factors, we even try to be more uh, aggressive um, in the 130 over 80 range. Next. Um, as far as uh, blood pressure agents, uh, you know, at the end of the day, there's going to be a variety of reasons why a patient can or can't be on a different class of medications, but I think uh, the, the bottom line is that their blood pressure needs to be treated uh, aggressively, and if it is, then that particular risk factor will be significantly reduced. There was uh, some data based on uh, the HOPE trial that ACE inhibitors uh, may uh, also have a, a neuroprotective uh, effect, you know, beyond their uh, uh, antihypertensive effects. I think the jury's still out on that, though. Next. Um, hyperlipidemia, in particular, elevation of LDL cholesterol, um, triglycerides, and low HDL are significant risk factors um, for vascular disease in general, but in stroke in particular, and it's the statins, the HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors, so-called statins, uh, that uh, lower the risk um, in, uh, of recurrent uh, uh, stroke um, in patients who've already had one. Um, we talk about high-intensity statin therapy um, a lot, uh, elevated uh, uh, cholesterols, in particular LDL, treated with uh, Lipitor, uh, Torvastatin, or uh, Crestor, Suvastatin, and they should be initiated early within uh, uh, the time period of the TIA or stroke. Uh, target LDL levels should be 100, less than 100 in general, and less than 70 in patients with concomitant uh, or concomitant diabetes. Uh, more recently, uh, the recommendations are leaning towards everybody being uh, less than 70, so um, I think there's an even larger role for uh, aggressive um, uh, risk factor uh, management. And of course, <clears throat> diet, we don't want to forget that. The medicines are good, but they are, uh, of course, an adjunct to uh, uh, lifestyle risk factor modifications like diet. Next. Sparkle trial uh, is the big one that we uh, talk about in quote that there was low risk of recurrent um, stroke risk in patients uh, with intensive, uh, uh, high intensity uh, uh, lipid medical management maxed out on Lipitor 80 milligrams, target LDL less than 70, and as soon after the either uh, index stroke or TIA uh, occurs. Next. Uh, all stroke TIA patients should, of course, be screened for diabetes um, if they're not known to be uh, uh, diabetic. Um, often they are known, and that's just a known risk factor. But if not, uh, that's obviously something that's easily uh, assessed with, with blood work. Next. And then we talk about other risk factors just in general. I think that these are sort of intuitive, uh, weight loss and good nutrition, in particular Mediterranean diet to uh, prevent obesity, exercise and weight loss, uh, moderation of alcohol, smoking cessation and regular exercise, 30 minutes uh, a day, at least three or four days a week. Next. So I'm sorry, I know this is a very busy slide. I'm gonna to try to cut to the chase though. Um, so the, this uh, uh, slide is discussing how we prevent strokes in patients who have non-cardioembolic strokes, which is the presumed mechanism of patients who have a very small vessel uh, infarcts, the, the type of strokes that we saw on the uh, right side of the screen earlier. Uh, they are not life-threatening, but they can be devastating neurologically uh, and leave a patient with, you know, dense uh, hemisensory or hemimotor uh, deficits. Um, in general, to treat these strokes, antiplatelets are favored over oral anticoagulation. Uh, there are uh, options that we have um, over the years. This has increased. We only had aspirin, you know, when I was in training. 
but uh, have since then uh, had um, studies showing, excuse me, um, aspirin slash dipyridamol, also called Agronox, and uh, clopidogrel, which is Plavix. Um, the uh, management of these patients uh, based on, oh, sorry, go back. Sorry, the management of these patients based on um, trials over the past decade has basically come down to the fact that um, aspirin and clopidogrel is reasonable to reduce the risk of stroke within 90 days without increasing the risk of, of hemorrhage. Um, and generally, based on the, the point trial, uh, the uh, treatment is with uh, dual antiplatelet therapy for 21 days after stroke, um, and then to stop one of the antiplatelets, uh, they should not be, uh, in general, and there are obviously exceptions, but in general, um, if the patient, um, uh, if, they, if they don't have significant coronary artery disease or other peripheral vascular disease, should only be on one or the other due to risk of bleeding and no uh, benefit in stroke. Um, and the, uh, the regimen uh, includes acutely uh, for patients who are not getting uh, TPA, of course, clopidogrel loading, uh, aspirin loading, um, and then daily aspirin, uh, 81 milligrams, and clopidogrel, 75 milligrams daily. Um, next. Uh, this is um, hot off the presses, uh, so to speak. Um, New England Journal a study earlier this year, uh, the THALES trial, which had been going on um, for, for quite some time, showed that in patients who have mild to moderate um, uh, ischemic strokes, uh, again, small vessel type, non cardioembolic, uh, those treated with the combination of ficagrelor, which is uh, Berlinta, the, the cardiac uh, interventionalists use this a lot. Uh, at 30 days, the risk was less than with aspirin alone, but the <clears throat> incidence of severe bleeding was more frequent uh, with the dual uh, antiplatelet therapy. So I'm not sure, uh, you know, how that's going to uh, play out over time. There are patients who uh, are poor metabolizers of, uh, of clopidogrel, um, uh, often mostly Asian patients who, in whom uh, this might be uh, a better option. So we will have to see what the guidelines recommend based on that. Next. Um, the other major type of stroke, uh, ischemic stroke that we talked about is that due to cardiogenic embolism, uh, most commonly atrial fibrillation. Uh, doesn't matter if it's continuous AFib or if it's paroxysmal AFib, what we call PAF. Patients need to be um, managed uh, in secondary prevention, prevention uh, aggressively. There are scores that we have to measure a patient's risk of having a stroke. Um, the, uh, the, the, I guess this slide is a bit out of date because it doesn't get too much into the CHADS2 VASC, um, the original uh, just CHADS2 score. Uh, said that patients who were uh, persistent uh, or PAF, um, uh, whose CHADS2 score was greater than two should be chronically anticoagulated. The CHADS2 VASC score, which is what I use now, um, basically says <clears throat> that if it's the same thing, if it's greater than two, they should be chronically anticoagulated. And that the, the, the scores are just um, uh, uh, basically different risk factors um, that are, are given a certain point value and you add them up and you come up with a number and then decide if the patient needs to be anticoagulated or if antiplatelet therapy may be appropriate. Um, I think that I'm sure everyone has uh, had experience with the new uh, uh, oral anticoagulants, the so-called NOAC, uh, N-O-A-C. Um, and these are anticoagulants that uh, are either direct thrombin inhibitors or uh, factor 10A specific inhibitors. So it's not uh, like a Coumadin uh, warfarin where it's uh, inhibiting the different uh, uh, clotting factors. And these drugs, Pixaban, uh, the Bigotran and uh, Rivaroxaban, um, I think everybody is familiar with. <clears throat> in patients who uh, can't be anticoagulated, these are patients who are fall risks or for another reason can't be anticoagulated, uh, they probably should be on aspirin, but uh, the, the um, data supporting that is, is fair at best.
Next, sorry. Um, in patients who, uh, in, in whom anticoagulation is contraindicated, the combination of um, the dual antiplatelet therapy that we talk, spoke about with aspirin and clopidogrel carries a similar, similar risk to anticoagulation and therefore is not uh, uh, recommended. Um, in patients, and just some of the criterion that we use to uh, decide what we're going to do uh, with patients who've had cardiogenic embolism in those with acute MI and left ventricular thrombus, um, as evidenced by echocardiogram, uh, those patients should be managed with oral anticoagulation when there's no contraindication. Uh, warfarin should be in the three, uh, to, I'm sorry, two to three uh, range and should be uh, continued at least uh, three months. Um, in patients who uh, have cardiomyopathy, ejection fraction less than or equal to 35%. Uh, the benefit of anticoagulation is not uh, uh, as clear, um, and it is reasonable to anticoagulate with warfarin or uh, use antiplatelet uh, drugs, including clopidogrel and Agronox, uh, depending on the uh, situation in the patient's concomitant um, uh, risk factors. Next. Valvular heart disease in those with rheumatic uh, mitral valve disease, whether or not they have AFib, a long-term anticoagulation is uh, said to be reasonable. Again, th th what I'm describing now are all based on guidelines, um, uh, American Stroke and Heart Association guidelines. Antiplatelet anti agents should not be routinely added uh, to anticoagulants due to risk in this setting, uh, valvular heart disease, uh, due to risk of bleeding on lack of data. Um, in patients who uh, don't have atrial fibrillation, it's reasonable, uh, or who, do, who don't have atrial fibrillation but have um, non-rheumatic mitral uh, or aortic valve disease, um, uh, antiplatelet therapy is reasonable. In patients with mitral valve prolapse or mitral annular calcification, antiplatelets can be considered. Again, this is you know based on the recommendations, guidelines. And in those who have mechanical prosthetic heart, value, heart valves, uh, it is reasonable to continue those patients on uh, warfarin or give those patients warfarin with a higher target INR, targeting about three on average. Um, if the patient has had an event while on warfarin, it is reasonable to add low-dose uh, aspirin or titrate their INR if they're at the, you know, if they're at the 2.5 range, you'd want to, you know, push it up to three or greater, three to 3.5, not higher than that, though, due to risk of bleeding. Next. Uh, Bruce, just, uh, we're close to five minutes, but uh, okay. take your time, but, you know, five minutes or so. <laughs> what number am I up to? Uh, I cannot tell. Okay, good. Next. <laughs> Cardiogenic embolism, as a general rule, antiplatelets uh, should not be routinely added to, to warfarin um, with the aforementioned risks, of course. Um, an, another uh, uh, area that's been studied a lot in, and recently, I think the guidelines, if they haven't already changed, are going to change um, that in patients who are under the age of 60 with a cryptogenic uh, embolic appearing stroke, uh, so-called ESUS, uh, embolic stroke of undetermined significance, is uh, something you'll probably see a lot in the in the literature. Um, for those patients, uh, it is reasonable uh, to close uh, a PFO uh, done by our interventional cardiologists endovascularly. Um, and those who opt for medical management, uh, uh, aspirin or anticoagulation may be acceptable. Stroke risk is increased, of course, in those who have an atrial septal aneurysm or a large uh, right to left uh, shunt. Next. Let's talk about intracranial stenosis. This is, a, this is an uh, interesting area. Um, patients who have symptomatic intracranial stenosis, like those with carotid stenosis, are at high risk for recurrent stroke. And um, based on uh, uh, a subset uh, of the, the original WARS trial, the big WARS trial, the WASI trial showed that in patients who have an intracranial stenosis 50 to 99%, that aspirin is preferred to uh, warfarin, meaning antiplatelet therapy uh, uh, to anticoagulation, um, as long as blood pressure maintenance and total cholesterol parameters are followed. Um, Kimone, uh, at this point, um, it is uh, uh, 
not clear what the role of angioplasty and stent, place, uh, stent placing is, uh, and it generally felt to be uh, uh, investigational. Um, I suppose there are circumstances in which those interventions need to be considered, uh, especially when extremely, extremely rarely today. Yeah, um, especially you know if patients fail to antiplatelet therapy. Um, and, you know, the, I, again, I, I'm sure somebody with the technical skills of Kimon uh, could, could, could do this. It's just not clear what its role is at this time. So next. <clears throat> um, so this was the title of an editorial that accompanied um, um, a, a, a study in JAMA Neurology, which was intracranial stenosis, one less thing to worry about. Um, it's more commonly seen in um, uh, Asians. Uh, it's, it, you know, as opposed to Caucasians who tend to have more extracranial uh, uh, carotid uh, uh, ICA uh, disease, uh, intracranial stenosis is more common uh, in the Asian populations. Um, the SAMPRAS trial in 2011 showed that stenting was not superior to uh, intensive medical management. Um, uh, use aspirin uh, and Plavix uh, with uh, high intensity statin and aggressive risk factor management. And I think based on, on that study, uh, it, it is pretty, as, as Kimon said, it's, it's rare when we uh, uh, intervene interventionally in those patients. But this study in JAMA Neurology showed that in patients who, um, uh, who are low risk of stroke, that, that it showed that patients who have an asymptomatic intracranial stenosis um, and those who already had strokes at different uh, locales, that the risk of stroke is very low uh, uh, in those receiving standard medical management. Um, and that's where the one less thing to worry about came up because now we know, um, at least based on that trial, that those patients can be uh, treated um, uh, with aggressive medical management, um, but not necessarily interventional management. Um, we spoke a little bit about WASID, uh, no benefit over um, aspirin, um, but there was over with warfarin over aspirin, but there were significantly more adverse uh, events uh, with, with the full anticoagulation with warfarin. Next. Just a couple of picks here. Um, we have uh, on the left, um, uh, an uh, MR angiogram of the intracranial vessels. Uh, and you can see where that arrow is pointing uh, to a uh, loss of a flow signal uh, in the middle cerebral artery, uh, which then reconstitutes uh, just, just distally to that. Um, and you can see that um, in the um, um, uh, in a CT angiogram of, of, of the similar uh, patient. So these are the types of things we're talking about, intracranial stenosis. And commonly, uh, you know, we, we certainly see these in, 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 in large uh, vessels, MCA, ACA, PCA, but uh, I think one of the times we see it the most commonly now is in patients um, uh, uh, who have uh, cavernous carotid uh, atherosclerosis. It's something that we see very, very frequently and yeah. certainly may be um, a, a causative mechanism in some cases. Next. Uh, so this uh, slide on the right is showing you, again, it's another uh, CT or MR uh, angiogram. Um, and the arrows are pointing to these focal areas of stenosis um, in more uh, distal uh, uh, MCA vessels, and what could potentially come from that, which is basically a wedge-shaped uh, infarct um, in the, uh, uh, on the in the right hemisphere, um, right frontal parietal region, um, and that that's what they can look like. And that's typically typically the mechanism there is artery to artery uh, embolism. Um, similar to what one might see with a, a embolic uh, carotid, uh, you know, cervical carotid uh, stenosis. Next. Other conditions, I'll just kind of briefly go through arterial dissection for uh, carotid vertebral arteries. Uh, antithrombotic therapy is reasonable, three to six months, and the efficacy of that compared to anticoagulation is unknown. If patients fail, medical therapy endovascular stenting may be considered based on guidelines. 
uh, thrombophilic states, uh, systemic malignancy, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, uh, again, depending on the place, the patient's uh, risk factors and the pathophysiology of the stroke. Either antiplatelets or anticoagulation may be reasonable. I know a lot of patients who have antiphospholipid antibody syndrome now um, are being treated with antiplatelets, where in the past they may have been on warfarin with a low target INR in the 1.8 to 2.2 range. And venous sinus thrombosis, uh, anticoagulation is felt to be probably effective and reasonable to be continued for uh, three to six months and then followed by antiplatelets. Next. Uh, patients with intra, uh, intracerebral hemorrhage who require anticoagulation uh, for patients who have a history of ICH, subarachnoid hemorrhage, subdural, anticoagulants and antiplatelets are reasonable to be stopped for at least one or two weeks after the index bleed. And then uh, if the patient is receiving warfarin, uh, it should be a reverse with FFP or a PCC and, and vitamin K. If you're on a novel anticoagulant, and DEXA can be used. Uh, protamine should be used on patients who are on IV heparin. And the decision to restart antithrombotic uh, therapy, I think, uh, is a, done on a case-by-case -case basis based on the patient's uh, presumed risk for recurrent uh, intracerebral hemorrhage. Um, but antiplatelets and anticoagulation may be started uh, within several weeks of the bleed, uh, assuming blood is resorbed. Next. Okay. C'est tout, as the French say. That's it. That's all, folks. Fantastic. Uh, Bruce, uh, real quick, we have a question from the audience. Uh, it says, if face is contraindicated, in a patient and dual antiplatelet therapy is not suggested due to bleeding risk. What I'm should sorry, I, I didn't hear the, the first part of this, the question. Oh, sorry. If anticoagulation is contraindicated in a patient and dual right. antiplatelet therapy is not suggested due to bleeding risk, what should you do then? Would you have any options for these? Yeah, you have uh, monotherapy with uh, either aspirin or, or Plavix if you can't give them, uh, uh, if you can't duly anticoagulate them. Um, you know, I mean, if if the patient has an issue in, in terms of clopidogrel, um, I think based on this uh, uh, Thales trial, I think that they're going to be using Berlinta aspirin combination uh, more frequently. I think we're going to probably start to see that would be my guess. And the other issue is, is if they're meta if they're if they don't metabolize uh, clopidogrel properly, they can be uh, put on um, aspirin. Uh, and not aspirin, Agronox, which is a combination of aspirin and, and, and dipyridamol. So that's always uh, a fallback uh, in patients in whom uh, clopidogrel is, is an issue with. Gotcha. For, for how long are you treating uh, when you have a dual? I mean, you know, we know three months or whatever for dual. Yeah. So after, I mean, what, what I've been doing is basically, you know, having the patients on dual antiplatelet therapy for three months. Yep. I don't have to scratch that for three weeks. I'm yep. sorry, 21 days. And at that point, I DC one or the other um, and continue that indefinitely. And that, that regimen for that three weeks has been shown, uh, you know, yeah. based on do most you, recent do you trials. Baby aspirin or full aspirin? I, I, t I, if I'm using dual antiplatelet therapy, I only use baby aspirin because intuitively, it, it, obviously the risk of bleeding is going to be higher or it's, uh, intuitively it seems like it would be higher if you're on four times the, the dose of, of aspirin. Yeah. And uh, AJ uh, uh, from uh, St. Charles is asking if there's a role for increasing the dose of aspirin from 81 to 325 uh, in secondary stroke prevention. Uh, the answer is we don't know. Um, sometimes we do it uh, because we don't know what else to do. But rather than do that personally, if someone is on aspirin and they're fa they're a so-called aspirin failure, even if it's a TIA that's an aspirin failure, I would uh, add, so that would stand for a stroke or a TIA, I would add Plavix. Um, again, I can't overstate the importance of uh, treating a TIA uh, the same way one would treat a small stroke. So, uh, you know, when a patient has a TIA, they look great, they were on aspirin. A lot of times I see them discharge on the same aspirin after they were worked up, but they failed that. And so those patients should be, if it's small vessel ischemia, presumably, they're not an AFib, whatever, they should be, you know, Plavix should be added, Clopidogrel should be added to that, or, you know, Agronox. Gotcha. You know, um, we're kind of running a little late on time. Nancy, I see as a question. Nancy, we're going to take that question offline, and uh, we're going to keep going with the last presentation of this uh, morning session, again, on, on 
uh, stroke prevention using uh, surgical or interventional treatments. Um, now, uh, Dr. Marison gave a, gave a very extensive presentation on the uh, medical uh, options that we have uh, when it comes to secondary and primary stroke prevention. I'm going to talk a little bit. Uh, you guys probably saw this slide before as uh, we were switching around, but uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the, the role of carotid revascularization. And, and Bruce alluded to that uh, when it comes to uh, preventing stroke in select patients. Um, so uh, my goals for this presentation are to describe the options for carotid revascularization and the evidence behind each option. Uh, and identify the complex landscape. Now we're, we're asked to navigate when we're trying to make these decisions. And uh, I lastly wanna show you what uh, innovative ways we've come up with at Good Samaritan Hospital uh, to empower uh, shared decision-making when it comes to these decisions. So carotid atherosclerosis, uh, everybody's very familiar with it. It's the buildup of plaque, uh, typically at the internal, external carotid artery, uh, right at the area of turbulent flow uh, at the neck. And uh, the challenge when it comes to carotid atherosclerosis is that when the plaque becomes uh, large enough, uh, it becomes also friable potentially and pieces of the plaque can break off. And that depends a lot on the consistency of the plaque, but pieces of the plaque can either break off and embolize or the plaque itself can rupture, form a clot on it, and that clot can then uh, uh, travel into the brain and cause a stroke. Uh, two ways that we have to treat this disease, and I'll, I'll tell you the criteria, Following uh, one is carotid endorectomy, which is an open procedure we do with an incision in the neck. Uh, we open the carotid artery and remove the plaque completely out of the carotid artery. And the other alternative is carotid artery stenting. Uh, very similar to the heart, we place a stent uh, after a balloon angioplasty uh, and opening up of the uh, stenotic area to completely crush the plaque against the wall. So obviously the carotid artery stenting is an option that does not remove the plaque, but really uh, uh, minimizes it and, and, and pushes it up against the wall behind the stent. Uh, so this is what carotid endorectomy looks like, obviously a little bit more invasive of a procedure. That's the carotid artery you can see with my cursor and we, we isolate every single vessel. Uh, the, um, uh, we tend to use a shunt. A shunt allows us to uh, preserve flow into the brain while we're operating on the carotid. And we have other tools also to identify whether a shunt is needed, such as neuromonitoring. We're trying to see if the brain is affected by us clamping the carotid at that time. Uh, but the shunt is a great way to preserve flow constantly in that area. This is what a plaque looks like. We have to remove it. Uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, calcium and cholesterol typically uh, deposited uh, on the plaque that we remove with the intima, the innermost layer of the carotid artery. And this is what a carotid artery looks like after we've removed the plaque and the shunt is in place. So the carotid artery is clean and, and uh, that's how we uh, prevent a stroke. Carotid artery stenting on the other side, everything is closed. We're through the groin or through the wrist, depending on the patient, depending on the anatomy, you see a blockage like this one. Uh, in this case, this, this is a symptomatic uh, uh, carotid. And uh, what we do is we place with balloon angioplasty, uh, this blockage and then place a stent. You see how nicely expanded the vessel is with a stent. And you can see on the uh, right hand side picture, uh, the stent in this, uh, in this unsubtracted uh, image. So what's the story behind carotid anorectomy? Uh, it's, it's one of the surgical procedures that has been studied the most. Uh, you know, we have a lot of evidence behind it, a lot of randomized trials. And so we have a fairly good understanding of when we should do it and when we shouldn't. Uh, so it was, uh, I, I'm sure, like everything, when we're trying to talk about the first of anything, there's a, a lot of controversy, but most people believe that the first carotid anorectomy was performed by Dr. DeBakey in Houston, Texas, uh, several years in the past, 1953. And uh, about 20 years ago, we had over 240,000 carot carotid anorectomies performed in the United States. Now that number has dropped significantly since, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about why that has been the case. Now there's a lot of guidelines when it comes to when do you intervene for uh, carotid atherosclerotic carotid stenosis. And when it comes to carotid anorectomy for symptomatic patients, we have a level one evidence for over 50% stenosis uh, and uh, your morbidity and mortality rate needs to be below 6%. When it comes to asymptomatic patients, uh, that cutoff is 60% and the surgeon's morbidity and mortality is less than 3%. So you want obviously a much safer surgeon when it comes to asymptomatic carotid disease because you want to, uh, you know, this patient has had no symptoms to begin with. Now, asymptomatic carotid disease, I mentioned with an asterisk because there's a lot of debate about it. 
And in my personal practice, the majority of the carotid interventions I do about probably over 90% are symptomatic, but there is value, we still believe in, in asymptomatic carotid disease. It's just that medical management has improved so dramatically since carotid uh, endorectomy was uh, established for asymptomatic patients that the evidence now uh, is still fairly murky when it comes to that. So that's what we know about carotid endorectomy, the open procedure. Now, are, have, have we compared that with carotid artery stenting uh, is uh, the real question. And yes, we have. There's been multiple studies. I have listed a few here, Wallstent, uh, Capita Space, EVA3S, and Sapphire. These are all different trials. And, and I guess the common denominator here is that those were not very good trials. Um, if you look at, uh, at the comparisons, uh, the... Uh, you know, they had very high risk of uh, death or stroke uh, in, the first, uh, in the first 30 days. So, so these are very, very high numbers. Uh, the stents that were used were variable. Distal protection device was not necessarily used everywhere, which uh, increases uh, the chance of a complication and the rates of stenosis were all over the place. So really not a lot of uniformity when it comes to these trials. Most importantly, I'm gonna talk about Sapphire because this was the trial that resulted in the approval of carotid artery stenting by the FDA for some indications. And so in this study, uh, there was a few patients that were randomized. The majority of the patients were not randomized. They were just assigned to a registry for carotid artery stenting. So the quality of the data is limited. You have symptomatic and asymptomatic patients all lumped in this study. And the primary endpoint is stroke, am I heart attack, or stroke, heart attack, or death uh, in uh, one year in this case. So if you compare carotid anorectomy and carotid artery stenting, this study actually showed a decreased risk of uh, the composite outcome in one year from uh, stenting. Now, because of, uh, so these, are, these were only high-risk patients for surgery, and I'll show you what high-risk meant for these folks, but 60% of the patients did not get randomized. They got, got straight into carotid artery stenting, so that is, was an obvious criticism. A lot of people complained about including myocardial infarction as an endpoint in this study. Uh, and they also complained about the very high morbidity and mortality in carotid anorectomy, you know, 10.2% 10, 10 in 30 days, which is very incompatible with the prior studies that I showed you where you needed to have 6% or below or 3% or below. So the argument is why did you let these people do carotid anorectomies and be part of the study? Clearly they have very high morbidity and mortality in their procedures. There was no medical comparison arm. So this was the definition of high risk. High risk really meant high risk for cardiac disease. So, uh, you know, if you had prior cardiac disease, pulmonary disease, carotid occlusions, other things, and at older age, over 80 years old, that was considered high risk. Now, a lot of this evidence or a lot of this data has been refuted in further trials, but this was the definition back then of high risk. Now you see, if you compare Sapphire uh, to uh, the 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 uh, the other trials that we have, you'll see you'll see that the event rate for Sapphire is extremely high at the at the beginning uh, of of the trials. So so the complication rate was so high that uh, uh, that that folks really criticized this trial. However, despite all the criticism, this resulted in the approval of carotid artery stenting by the FDA. Uh, for over 50% symptomatic carotid stenosis, very similar to uh, carotid endorectomy. Now, there was a follow-up study several years, years later in 2008 that demonstrated no difference between the two uh, interventions. Now, other, uh, this was Sapphire. Now, there's been a, a bunch of others, uh, other randomized control trials, also uh, very problematic, uh, that showed that carotid endorectomy is better. So this added to the confusion, so, so space, demonstrated that carotid anorectomy is better. EVA3S demonstrated that there's a learning curve for carotid artery stenting, so in favor of carotid anorectomy. Then if you get all these trials, positives and negatives, and try to do an analysis of all the data together, so we have a meta-analysis, uh, folks demonstrated that actually stenting was associated with higher risk of complications at 30 days. So how do we reconcile all the data? Well, that happened with a CREST trial. The CREST trial, uh, was the end all be all of all trials, very well thought out trial. Uh, it, it had, a, uh, it had a, 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 a learning period for the interventionalists to learn how to do the stenting without complications. It used competent neurointerventionalists, competent uh, surgeons 
to identify what intervention is, is better. And the inclusion criteria were very strict. It was an NIH funded trial. Over 2,500 patients were part of it. And as I said, there was a credentialing phase. So you had to have had 20 carotid artery stenting procedures to get to be included in the CREST trial. Uh, and the primary endpoint was cumulative cardiovascular events of so stroke, MI, and or death in one month and so 30 days and four years. And there's a bunch of other secondary goals. Now in the lead in phase of the CREST trial where you know, we had this, this credentialing phase for the interventionalists, what we realized was actually extremely helpful. Look at the stroke rate for carotid artery stenting in less than 60 years, 60 to 70 years, 70 to 80 and over 80 years. You see that as the patients get older, the chance of a complication from carotid artery stenting increases dramatically. Uh, so this lead-in phase in this trial resulted in exclusion of octogenarians and nanogenarians from the real trial. So what we know about carotid artery stenting really applies to younger patients. So there should be a lot of caution when you are stenting an older uh, person. And based on this study, you probably shouldn't, which is uh, completely opposite to what Sapphire demonstrated. But Sapphire was a really poor study. This, it was really a phenomenally executed trial. And this is what I said, you know, the octogenarians and nongenarians were excluded. So what were the results? So you see this graph, both carotid and rectomy and stenting seem to be similar in their outcomes, in the cumulative risk of stroke, heart attack, or uh, death. What was the difference? As I said, the composite was very similar between the two. Now, the periprocedural risk of stroke or death was, or actually risk of stroke, was higher with carotid artery stenting, whereas the risk of MI was higher with carotid endorectomy. So there's a bit of a trade-off, it seems like. If you have a very uh, heavy cardiac patient, uh, then it makes a lot of sense to go the carotid artery stenting route. If you have a patient that's doesn't have a lot of cardiac um, uh, comorbidities, then it makes sense uh, to go the endorectomy uh, route. And the four-year risk of stroke obviously was also higher in the stenting group. Now, the argument is that a stroke is the major cause of disability in these patients. So what we're trying really to reduce, despite the fact that on, in regards to the cumulative risk, both interventions seem similar, the fact that carotid artery stenting is associated with a slightly higher risk of stroke should be taken into account. We're trying to prevent disability, so it does make sense to use carotid nanorectomy as our first line uh, of treatment for these patients, unless contraindicated for you know, whatever other reason. Now, when it comes to asymptomatic carotid disease, there's been another paper recently, ACT1, uh, published at the New England Journal, that compared stenting and endorectomy, and again, showed similar results between the two. Now, there was no medical arm, and that's key for asymptomatic carotid disease. And if, uh, if Bruce is still on the line, maybe we'll chat about it after uh, uh, when we're done with this. But the, the, the presence of medic, best medical management is key when it comes to asymptomatic carotid disease. We should be very careful when we recommend in carotid endorectomy or stenting in these folks. And this is reflected here. This was a, a, a poll that was conducted by the New England Journal of Medicine several years in the past, over 12, 12 years ago. And what the question was, you know, you have a 60 year old guy, he has 70% uh, carotid stenosis and has been completely asymptomatic. He is on a statin, high dose statin initially then adjusted. He is on an aspirin, he's not smoking, his high blood pressure medications are administered and he's controlled, um, so he's on, best medical management, risk factor control. And this is, the question was, would you do a carotid intervention or not? And this is what folks answered. So you can see that even in North America, about half the physicians would recommend medical management. Now, these are not surgeons. These are primary care doctors. And, and you would expect them to be biased for medical management, but, but still see, you know, this kind of shows you that there is a trend. And across the world, you see that number is even higher, up to 56%. Uh, to not do anything uh, for asymptomatic uh, carotid artery stenosis. So that debate is really not re resolved yet, uh, especially since we're waiting for results from uh, trials such as CREST-2, uh, 
uh, where asymptomatic population will be particularly targeted, especially when it comes to a comparison group with best medical management. Now, as I, as I mentioned at the beginning, there is uh, a significant drop in the number of carotid anorectomies, carotid artery stenting procedures performed across the United States. And so this is data from a paper we published, I believe in the British Medical Journal, where we demonstrated that over the last several years, 20, 30 years, there's been a steady trend for decreased interventions uh, uh, across the board for carotid anorectomy and carotid artery stenting. There was a little bump with carotid artery stenting when it was uh, discovered, and then uh, it also started to downtrend. So there's no there's no substitution of endorectomy with stenting. It, it kind of seems that they're both are going down and probably, and, and this is uh, the same graph if we, we broke it down by subspecialty, vascular surgeons, thoracic surgeons, neurosurgeons. So everybody else, everybody is dropping really. And uh, the real question is why is that happening? And that probably has to do with best medical management. It has to do with referrals. So, you know, if, if, uh, if the cardiologists or or the neurologist or whoever sees these carotid uh, 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 disease, sees carotid disease, they maybe not are not referring as much as much just because now medical management is so potent and they believe in it. And so obviously the surgeons are doing less procedures. Um, so, so where do we stand today as com comparing carotid anorectomy and carotid artery stenting? There's been only one positive randomized control trial for carotid artery stenting. Um, and a lot of industry funded uh, registries uh, that were not randomized. CRISH trial demonstrated a higher risk of stroke with carotid artery stenting, but a higher risk of MI with carotid endorectomy. Truth is, decisions should be tailored to the particular patient by a physician who's able to perform both treatment options. If you are, and, and us at the Comprehensive Stroke Center at Good Samaritan Hospital, we're, we're able to perform both carotid endorectomies and carotid artery stenting you need to tailor the decision to every individual patient. For example, difficult anatomy, prior neck operations, high riding bifurcations may be better for stent. Uh, heavy cardiac patients also may be better for stent. Again, anatomy of the lesion should be considered, as I mentioned, and consider diagnostic angiography, you know, especially if, if there is a there, there, there are decision uh, points uh, that have to be made, especially if, if we're considering an endovascular procedure, diagnostic angiography uh, can be uh, key. Uh, as I said, the jury's still out uh, when it comes to asymptomatic patients. Uh, if we compare them to best medical management, we really uh, do not have uh, any evidence, any solid uh, evidence uh, yet when it comes uh, to that. Now, as I said, there's gonna be some answers in the future. ACST2 and CREST2 are uh, uh, bound to give us some answers when it comes to uh, the asymptomatic group and the comparison to best medical management. So we're eagerly awaiting uh, results from those trials. Now, you know, how do we navigate this complex landscape and get the patients into the decision-making process? Well, you know, that, that is, that is difficult, but there are solutions to that. And, and by harnessing the power of large data sets, we've created predictive tools uh, and, uh, through advanced analytics that if you have your patient's risk factors, you can input them in that predictive tool and that tool can give you your risk of a procedure. So the patient can really make a decision based on their individualized risk factors. And this is from a study my group published in Stroke uh, several years ago that kind of shows you the risk stratification and we took that study and created an app called NeuroRisk, where we were uh, patients are able to select their procedures, select their risk factors, and then eventually, whoops, excuse me for that. And eventually, the the, the app gives you a number uh, of risk, and the patient can make a decision. So it's key to get in these challenging decisions, such as you know carotid neurectomy or stenting, coiling or clipping, or whatever have you, especially when it comes to a surgical intervention that can result in morbidity and mortality, getting the patient involved at the ground with a shared decision-making tool like this uh, is, uh, is key. Uh, and with that, I wanna thank you. And I'm gonna take any uh, questions. Uh, let me see, is Bruce still with us? Perfect. Uh, Bruce, how do you feel about um, asymptomatic uh, carotid interventions? Uh, <clears throat> I think it depends on the severity of the uh, stenosis, uh, mostly. 
Um, a lot of these patients are now, um, you know, because we have statins, you know, when, when most of these uh, early trials were done, we, we didn't have statin therapy. We didn't have dual antiplatelet therapy. Hold on one second. So you just close that door for me, please. Thank you. Sorry. Hello. You hear me? Yes. Yep. Can't hear you. Okay. Yeah. So, so I, I think a lot of these uh, trials uh, came out before we had, um, uh, again, high intensity statin therapy and dual antiplatelet therapy. And I think that that's really changed the, the uh, uh, landscape of how these things are managed. Um, I think that, you know, I mean, if you look at patients in WASD who had 50 to 99% um, uh, stenosis uh, and, you know, were, were not better off being anticoagulated. Uh, and you wonder if that sort of thing can be extrapolated to um, uh, carotid disease. But I think that uh, obviously there's a role for, for me personally, if I had the choice between a, a, a complication of a heart attack or a stroke, I'd probably take the heart attack and the endarterectomy rather than the, the stroke and the stent. But um, I, I think that you know, with the asymptomatic uh, patients, a lot of it is is judgment, following them closely, making sure that risk factor management is in place, and aggressive antiplatelet uh, and statin uh, therapy. And we may be able to do more with that than we knew about when the tri the big trials of um, uh, um, yeah. carotid revascu yeah. revascularization. Well, the initial trials for asymptomatic carotid disease were. Um you know, the best medical management was aspirin, a baby aspirin. Right. Uh, versus, a, and the benefit was after five years. So, you know, you did surgery. Right. Surgery was more harmful, but five years later, there was a crossover and surgery was more impactful. And that's another point that is important that I've frequently brought up when it comes to decision-making. The, the surgeon obviously needs to have an understanding of the life expectancy of the patient. If the patient is asymptomatic, their life expectancy, they're a sick person and their life expectancy is not more than five years, then probably you're not going to benefit them by doing a carotid intervention um, you know, uh, at that point. You would benefit in the young person probably, uh, you know, in a 55-year-old diabetic with a 90% stenosis, I think it's a no-brainer that you need to intervene. But uh, uh, if, uh, if you have an 80-year-old with an 80% stenosis, I would not I, I personally would not do an intervention for that asymptomatic. Symptomatic, yeah. any problem, but asymptomatic, I would not. Yeah, I mean, the, I guess one of the main problems is is that everyone and their mother gets a, a, a carotid Doppler study. If, I mean, I, you know, there isn't a syncope patient in my hospital who, who doesn't get a carotid duplex. Uh, still not really sure why, um, but th this has just become the standard of care. So I, while I, I may not order them myself, they're always, I'm always superseded by somebody. And that's, I think, probably in, in patients with syncope or dizziness or things that aren't related to carotid disease at all, they wind up getting uh, um, a Doppler study. Uh, and then, of course, you know, you get something with a reading of a range of, you know, 50 to 69 percent. You know, I think things are different if it's closer to 70 versus if it's closer to 50 so, um, I, you know, these incidental carotids uh, uh, are, are a real issue um, and they come up frequently. And I think with the um, use of high intensity statin therapy and uh, an aggressive antiplatelet management, uh, most of these patients can be managed medically. Uh, but yeah, of course, there are times when, like you said, you know, have a young patient with a critical stenosis. You know, if that's me, I want to get taken yeah. to the OR, you know. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. Thank you, Bruce. Um, before we go on break, I uh, just want to let people know, we, we switched the order of the speakers around. Uh, uh, I know that we had the American Heart Association um, uh, talking uh, briefly at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, we had a little bit of a snafu. Uh, and uh, now uh, we have, uh, we're able to have Leslie Bellissimo. Uh, from the American Heart Association uh, uh, address the meeting. Uh, and when she's done, we're going to go on break. But it's uh, my distinct pleasure to introduce her. She, uh, we know, we've known her since we opened the program here at Good Samaritan Hospital. And she has been uh, a really uh, a, a force for the mission of the American Heart Association and has uh, helped us also 
realize our mission. So uh, without further ado, uh, thank you, Leslie, for being here. And uh, we're looking forward to listening to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Beckles. Can you hear me? We're good? Yes. I'm Leslie Bellissimo, and I am the Senior Director for the American Heart Association um, here on Long Island. The American Heart Association's mission is to be a relentless force for a world of longer, healthier lives. We do that by raising funds that make groundbreaking research discoveries possible. We use our resources to educate individuals of the risks, factors, and warning signs around heart disease and stroke. And we also help to make healthy choices the accessible and easy choice for residents living in our local communities. The American Heart Association is an inclusive organization that champions health equity for all people by speaking up for those with no voice and fighting tirelessly for health equity. We are a fundraising organization that not only raises funds for heart and stroke research, but we also work very hard to educate that the choices we make every day can really help prevent heart disease and stroke. <clears throat> One of the American Heart Association's focuses this year is on high blood pressure. And there is such a need to educate our communities on the importance of knowing their numbers. Managing blood pressure and blood glucose and controlling cholesterol are just some of the ways we can prevent heart disease and stroke. And as I mentioned earlier, we strive to educate people on how to spot stroke warning signs and how to call 911 that can save a life and make the difference between full recovery and long-term disability. As Dr. Beckel has said, I met his him and his team at the Stroke and Aneurysm Center of Long Island back when they first opened. They are an amazing group of individuals who are truly saving so many lives. Their facility is top notch and I am proud to say that they are certified by the American Heart Association as a comprehensive so stroke center. Aside from being so brilliant, Dr. Beckelis is kind and caring and he truly takes time with his patients. Um, just a quick personal story. I had a personal health issue two years ago. I had a pancreatic pseudoaneurysm. And even though it wasn't a brain aneurysm, he really took the time out of his schedule of complex brain and spine surgeries to really study my chart and explain the care that I was getting and reassure me that everything was gonna be all right. He checked on me from time to time and he gave me the reassurance that I needed to know that I in fact was gonna be okay. And I wasn't even his patient. So I can't imagine what the, the, the time and attention that he gives to those who he cares for. Dr. Beckles has really been a tremendous volunteer for our organization. His team has participated in our Long Island Heart Walk, doing blood pressure screenings and handing out stroke information. He's currently one of our board of directors for the American Heart Association's Long Island Board. Uh, he has shared our Long Island Heart and Stroke Wall, helping raise close to $500,000 for our mission. We honor Dr. Beckles at our 2018 Heart and Stroke Ball for the work that he does for local brain, stroke and brain aneurysm patients and for his collaboration with our organization. His affiliation with the American Heart Association has really helped us raise stroke awareness here on Long Island and for that we will be forever grateful. Uh, Catholic Health Services of Long Island, Good Samaritan Hospital Medical Center and the team at the Bro Brain and Stroke Aneurysm Center work side by side with the American Heart Association to advance our services and our mission daily. But most importantly for us at the American Heart Association, this continued collaboration really helps improve the health of the community, helping us prevent strokes, save lives from stroke beyond, throughout Long Island and beyond. And I know that the impact of this support is gonna be realized for many years to come. So thank you very much for letting me address this conference and now go have some lunch. Thank you, thank you, Leslie. And uh, for everybody, uh, uh, please support the mission of the American Heart Association. There's multiple ways you can support. Uh, I will uh, include some links at the end of the conference, but uh, there's a lot of events that we organize on Long Island. I mentioned earlier the Heart Walk, Heart and Stroke Walk. Uh, and, but there's also several galas and other events that have uh, honored uh, uh, even members of uh, the Good Samaritan Hospital, um, you know, Dr. Lamandola in the past, our, our program. And, and so, uh, you know, the, the nothing, uh, you know, a lot of the initiatives that happen in schools when it comes to defibrillators and things like that are actually led by the American Heart Association, but they cannot do it without uh, our support. Leslie, thank you for coming uh, to the conference. And uh, Thank you. And, and so for, uh, for the rest of you guys, from 12 to 12, uh, from 11.30 to 12, I guess 11.37 to 12, we'll take a, sweet, uh, a short break. 
Uh, and at 1230, we have our breakout seminars. The breakout seminars, there's three of them. Uh, I will send you now, um, I will put up on the screen the links uh, where you can go to for this, these breakout sessions at, at 12 o'clock. If you're participating in Dr. Bramantis' uh, breakout session, remain in this feed. If you're not, if you're at the nursing or the rehabilitation, uh, just use the, a different link uh, that's gonna be available. And then when you're done with your breakout session, go back into the link you used to be in this conference and log back in. Hopefully we're not gonna lose 80% of you uh, during uh, the breakout session, uh, but uh, that's how we're gonna do it. If there's any problems, questions, email me, use the feed. This is gonna remain open because we're gonna have Dr. Bermantis conference in here uh, at 12.30. And so enjoy your lunch. I'm sorry we cannot be together for it this year, but uh, we will be uh, together next year. All right, thanks everybody. And I'll see you shortly.